going everyone jeff jorgensen here before we start this episode i want to give a huge thanks and a huge shout out to rescue swimmer mindset for putting on this interview they went ahead and send me the raw video i'm gonna go ahead and post it here for you guys but i highly recommend you check the card up ahead and click on that link to watch this video you're more than welcome to watch it here these are two Coast Guard rescue swimmers who have retired since then and were awesome enough to do a very long form podcast interview with me. Please check them out. We go over a couple different things such as the differences between Coast Guard rescue swimmers and Navy rescue swimmers, different experiences that I've gone through, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So please check that card up above. We're going to be coming out with more content here soon on this channel. They come out with a lot of amazing content on their channel, so subscribe to their channel and don't forget to subscribe and like to our channel here. And without further ado, let's start the podcast. What's your biggest pet peeve as an instructor? People thinking they're smarter than the system oh. and having <laughs> no idea what's in store. To episode 55 of the Rescue Swimmer Mindset. I'm your host, Vince, joined with co host Cody. What's up? Welcome to our show. Today we have the two opposing branches. They're not opposing, really. They're actually the big rivalry. quite symbiotic in a way. The Coast Guard and the Navy. What's the difference between a Coast Guard and a Navy rescue swimmer? I feel like there should be a joke no lined idea. up with that, but um, we're going to find yeah. out today with our. Our guest, Jeff Jorgens, who was a Navy rescue swimmer instructor and who's, who is still a Navy rescue swimmer. So quite interesting having a conversation with him and, and just every different things that they can do in the Navy versus kind of a, a Coast Guard rescue swimmer who's more niche. Um, it's very broad. Yeah, a lot of jobs, you know, it's just kind of cool. Good it's stuff. very cool. I, I thought it was actually, I was like raising an eyebrow like, man, I, maybe I, I did join the, the wrong branch because they get to travel. They get to do a lot of stuff, like a lot of ver like diversified things. Um, so it keeps things it's interesting. It's, it keeps things. Yeah. yeah. Great. So yeah, Jeff Jorgens, our guest today. Uh, before we start, we have in the upcoming week in the Risk Storm Mindset, we have a, a workshop, a private workshop slash masterclass. So if you're training to you know go any kind of elite military uh, route or you're an athlete that wants to learn we're probably going to do it based on underwater uh, tips and techniques so this will be a powerpoint type of presentation and uh, check out the the rsm training circle on facebook join that if you haven't already and we'll, we'll be yeah kind of telling people all about it and, and and keeping you guys in the loop about it as as we build this class up uh, but don't miss yeah. that that's coming it's going to have a Q&A session too, so a, a good portion of that, well, the back half of that class or back like quarter is going to be a lot of questions and answers based on the material material we cover in the course. Absolutely. So, solid. Yep. Also, yeah, just go leave a rate, rating and review on the Apple Podcast page. Get it done. Great. You could use them five stars. Also, if you like entertaining wilderness adventure stories, check out the Wildertainment Podcast, also on Spotify, YouTube, and all that jazz, Apple Podcasts. Great. Navy rescue swimmer, Jeff Jorgens. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time. I know the time difference a little off, but I'm glad, and it's been a little bit, but I'm glad we got it to work. Yeah, you're in the future. In the future. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's 3 p.m. over here on a Wednesday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you think it would be nice being in the future, but really it's just the same. You just wake up and you're like, come on, the rest of the world, like, catch up. Because like show releases, <laughs> everything you want, you still have to wait on. Yeah. I was wondering like <laughs> September 11th in Guam, is that like September 10th? Like, you know, like big moments. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Well, they are. It's it's still, the, I mean, it's still, you celebrate the day. So like Thanksgiving, I'm going to celebrate with my family today because, um, but as far as like other days and stuff like that, like New Year's happens obviously way early. Um, 
but right. just celebrate a little bit earlier. That's it. How do you like Guam? Um, I'm going to say this about Guam. I, I had the pleasure of going there. I was nice. originally, yeah, I was originally supposed to get stationed as a non-rate in Guam on a buoy tender. Ooh. And that was the dream for me. I had, I had just like recently finished working construction before joining the military. I, I heard like the buoy <laughs> tenders. It's like, it's gritty work. I was like, yeah, let's get on it. And then I was like, all I asked to the recruiter is send me as far away from the continental United States as possible. And he <laughs> delivered like Guam. I was like, jackpot got it made and then the packet they send me is like all right pack uh your snorkel gear your scuba gear your surf kit like and your board shorts it's gonna be a riot and i was like Woo! <laughs> i was like yeah. let's go to go off <laughs> and then um like a couple days later in, in boot camp some real cocky yeoman um so that the you know the clerk comes and he goes uh all right jennifer you're going to yeah california uh Brittany, you're going to I don't know, Detroit, Vince, you're going to Hawaii. I go, no, I'm, I'm going to Guam. And he yeah. goes, no, you're not. You're going to Hawaii. And I go, no, I'm going to Guam. And he goes, that's not what you promised me. <laughs> that's not, it's not what it is. And now it's, you're going to Hawaii on a, on a cutter. And I was like, and it sounded like such a spoiled kid, but I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew that cutter life is a little different than a buoy tender life. Um, as in like you're, you're painting more than actually doing some, some oh, work. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, my question. Yeah. How do you like Guam? I love it. I chose to come out here. Uh, it's really interesting. We always say that there's like two kind of people that come out here. There's people that, uh, you know, chose to come out here and wanted to come out here and people that did not want to come out here and got drug out here. There's no like in between, like I'll go to Guam, like, which is really interesting to me, um, especially because this is one of the duty stations that, uh, I mean, you, they get, we get the most rescues out of everyone because we're the only asset in the entire area. There's nothing. So we get calls all the time for like cruise vessels and, you know, like my second flight here, we had to fly out like a hundred 20 it was close to 120 luckily it was like only 100 miles to go to this fishing vessel to get this guy off that was in a really bad shape so um if you want to do the job like it's the perfect station for your first tour this is my third not counting do you guys have short so you have sea and shore rotation in the navy or basically you go to sea and because sea is basically you're deployable and then when you are basically you do that tour and then in between there you have a shore duty where you instruct or you um do some kind of like not as high pace because they can, they can only get so much out of you if they were to deploy you all the time people would not stay in um do they have that with you guys not really no. Yeah, yeah, typically we have a few, like we have an instructor tour, you know, mm -hmm. you could do that, but th there's nothing required. So basically you could do a full operational duty rotation for 20 years, 30 years, or not 30, but 20 years. Okay. And just get out. Yeah. But I had a buddy who was a, uh, who's in the Coast Guard. Um, I think he's, I think he's still in, uh, he went to a lot, he went to Alaska, uh, to Kodiak. He, cause you guys separate it. And correct me if I'm wrong. You guys separate it between swimmer and crew chief, basically. Whereas so, you guys are AST, and then you have a right. Yeah, we so we have AST where you're the rescue swimmer, and you're mm -hmm. just basic air crewman on the helicopter. Yeah. But we also have a flight mechanic on there who's doing the the hoisting and all the actual like the legit air crew stuff, where you're worrying about you know mechanical issues stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So he was in Kodiak and he was saying that was the big thing that um, swimmers were having a hard time with there because he was a flight mechanic. He said, you either want to go there or you get drugged there. And I was like, who would, and I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, I, I think it's the same with Guam. It's like, that's amazing to me is people come in and they just kind of want to coast out. And it's like, if you want to do the job, go someplace where you're going to get the rescues. Yeah. yeah. Well, you describing Guam just now, it sounds like, yeah, the Coast Guard's version of Alaska. It's it's one of those very remote locations. You're going to be far mm -hmm. away from the resources of the continental U.S. Uh, that said, it's it's Case City as far as search and rescue goes. So, um, yeah, I, I never thought of that because I don't think the Coast Guard's t it's present in Guam. But as far as uh, there's no air station there. So I guess you guys are picking up that that duty, which is really yeah. cool. Um, and yeah. earlier we were talking yeah. about secret gems and in my perspective, 
you know, Guam is a hundred percent a secret gem. In my opinion, it's it's a better version of Hawaii as far as like it's less crowded now. Um, you know, and oh, nobody yeah, knows exactly. about it. Nobody like. Yeah. Can you actually tell people where Guam is? Because I know half the people listening don't know where it is. Yeah. So if you're looking for like Hawaii is pretty easy to follow, but if you go to Google Maps, like you got to type it in. If you don't know where it's at, you're never <laughs> gonna find it. So if you go to like, if you go to, uh, it's like. If you follow Japan east and then like Papua New Guinea, no, kind of north east from, th- or from there, it's in the middle of the ocean. There's nothing around. Yeah. Um, you're in the middle of nowhere. It's a small island. Uh, I think there's a funny video. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's by some politician who's actually still in office, in, which is amazing to me. Uh, he was briefing an admiral on Guam. And he got so he's like, I'm they're moving a whole bunch of Marines here. And he was concerned that Guam would get so populated that he was afraid it was going to tip over. Oh. Like he asked, this is a sitting congressman right now, asked it to an admiral. So that's how small the island is. So you can you can go the entire island in like an hour from top to bottom. But the max speed is 35. Everywhere. So, everywhere so it's really small it takes forever to get stuff here so as far as that but the most beautiful beaches i've been to in my i've I've been to all kinds of different places all the world from plummets but diving is freaking amazing um i was gonna say um i i think i've talked about on the podcast before but i've addressed how sad it is through like traveling the world and and going even southeast asia and some of the the allegedly most renowned dive spots like uh komodo islands area in uh indonesia is that indonesia? yeah indonesia um you know i've been to hawaii and just a lot of different places where they say yeah. like best scuba diving ever but you know sadly everything's bleach i've been even to australia it's bleached it's just sad everything's dying but guam back when i went i think in 2012 or something wow okay. it was like like finding nemo underwater it was oh yeah and i don't know how it's you know i'm sure there's impacts now still with environmental change but it was so beautiful just the vegetation the alg- algae um it was oh yeah awesome yeah it's it's a beautiful island there's tons of there's tons of coral i mean it, it's everywhere um but as far as like yeah there there definitely is impact uh no matter where you go it's it's gonna happen a but lot. as far as that goes yeah yeah, I'll try to share some of your videos if, if you're okay with that on YouTube yeah, for those cool. tuning in. Um, no, if they want to check out Guam, the, the secret island. <laughs> and and not not to drag too long on Guam, but I was curious, like there's other islands too, right? Just, but uninhabited. Yeah, yeah no, so, t- 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 so there's tons of history here. Um, I did a video on my channel, of just kind of like Guam in general. And there's like, so Guam was a huge, uh, there was a huge battle on Guam in World War II. They, you know, the Japanese enslaved the indigenous people, but then you have Saipan, which was another huge battle that's uh, north of here. There's about four islands. You have um, four big ones to know. You have Guam, which is the main one. Then you have uh, Rhoda, which is the next one up as you go north. Then you have Tinian. Tinian was actually where the atop, the both atomic bombs took off from before they actually uh, basically you know, drop the bombs on Japan. I didn't know. So, yeah. So we there, if you actually go there, the field that's still there and the structure, it's an abandoned airfield now, but we were able to like fly there and like kind of land and check it out. And there's this little museum that we're like only military can really see. Uh, It's kind of cool. And like I said, rich rich in history site. And then the next one up is Saipan. Saipan is the next really big one that you have people fly into a lot. Um, but Saipan, there was a huge, huge battle. And the reason why Guam, the invasion of Guam by the U.S. went so well is because the U.S. Uh, I'm a huge history buff, if you can't tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they did. Uh, when they went into Saipan, they learned a lot of lessons uh, and they lost a lot of people. And there's actually this one cliff that they call Bonsai Cliff, where a lot of people actually committed suicide during World War II because they thought when the U.S. came, that they were going to enslave the Japanese people. But Guam is a, a freaking is the main spot, and that's where most of the cool stuff is. Cool. Um, what about COVID in Guam? What's the situation? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's the same anywhere else, just a little different. I mean, Guam is is unique. 
as far as getting stuff out here and shipping anything. So like Amazon two day shipping is like Amazon month shipping, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But as far as the impact of health, uh, we, and, and again, I want to preface this also, like everything that I say here, and I should have started this is my own personal opinion because I'm active duty. Like nothing is representative of the Navy in any way, shape or form. So this is my own personal experience and my own opinion and doesn't represent the Navy in any way. Yep. So, uh, we've had to, we've, we've had to pick up um, different stuff. So implement COVID procedures, stuff like that for patient transfer. But as far as Guam as a whole, uh, it's had spikes. Um, it's had right now it's kind of going through a spike, but for a while there was lockdowns just like everywhere else. Um, it just happens, I would say a little bit differently um, because there's only so many places you can go. Um, but the main concern here is, you know, the healthcare facilities. You know, Guam is the only place I think on island one time, they only had like 20 ventilators or something like that at the hospital. So there was a huge concern because at that point, like you're not going to be shipping someone super far. Right. So, yeah. Crazy. All right. Let's get on topic of Navy <laughs> helicopter rescue swimmers. Um, okay. Why don't you maybe give us a, well, maybe explain what a, a Navy helicopter rescue swimmer does and maybe a little bit of the day in the life. Okay. So it all depends. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of questions when it comes to that. And a lot of people don't have answers. And the reason why I say that, and, and again, why I started the channel I did was because there's no standard day. It's very different. Um, I'll just kind of break down, um, responsibilities like and that's one thing i think is really different from for example coast guard from navy um and and i'll be honest like there's a lot of guys that join the navy thinking that as a air rescue candidate who think that the, all they're going to do is search and rescue which is you know you would want that that'd be perfect but the hard part about it is the navy does um it, it's a it's a war fighting force so Yes, we do stand uh, SAR alert and we do rescues and all that, but a lot of the stuff is focused towards tactics, whether that be personnel rescue, special operations support, um, you know, inserts and extracts, uh, depending on which platform you're in, you might do sub hunting. Um, but a normal day varies dramatically. Like, you know, one day I might wake up and do a recoil on a gun shoot on a 240 or a gal, which is a 7.62, um, basically crew serve weapon or machine gun for your average person. Or I might do a gal shoot, which is a 50 cal machine gun uh, or crew serve weapon. Or I might just go fly around the island and get currency on different stuff. I might, you know, we do unprepared landing. So they call it turf. So you go land in a field and you know, re up certain currencies, or you might work with external forces doing uh, anti piracy training, inserting guys onto a ship and then putting, you know, snipers on board. Now, that's not all the time. Um, a normal day, I would say, is coming in, fulfilling whatever flight you have on the flight schedule if you are flying that day. If not, there's a lot of ground maintenance as far as like not necessarily not working on the helicopter, but logs and records, making sure everyone's current. Um, like, like I said, I'm in charge of the, the SAR program here as well as NATOP. So that's, um, dealing with making sure that your flight status of everyone is good. And also on the SAR side, you're good. So there's a lot of moving pieces that you got to make sure everyone's current. Cause if not, you know, it's a, it's a freaking slap on the wrist and they you can go down as a, as a squadron. So, um, yeah, it just depends. It wilds. It, it's very dramatic, but you don't fly as much as you, the prep and the post and everything maintenance wise, as far as logs and records is a lot of work. Yeah. So everyone just sees that like two minute flight window, like you do, but there's so much that goes into it before and after. Yeah. Maybe Cody, you can do a comparison of what yeah, the coast awesome. guard rescue swimmers do versus what Jeff just explained. Yeah. I mean, I guess my, one question also would be how many times a week would you fly and does it vary um based on your seniority so a lot of times in the coast guard the younger guys or, or females will get in you know and fly more often and then as you kind of advance and get a little older you're doing more paperwork 
and the computer side, you know, trying to do all the currencies and keeping the logs and stuff. Uh, it def so uh, I would say a little different. The more seniority you get and the more qualifications you have, the more you're flying more uh, because you're qualifying the new guys. So you'll go through a two, your two-year pipeline. You'll get to your squadron, and then uh, you'll be getting getting ready to get current. So yeah, you'll still have flights. You still probably have to get fully qualified from the moment you get to your squadron to the fact that you're like a qualified aviation rescue swimmer in all mission sets or as what you're supposed to be. It's going to take you about another year and a half to two years. So by the time you're fully qualified in the Navy, I would say fully qualified, you can still branch out different areas. It's going to take you four years. So you would you say that's from start to finish? So like you're out of boot camp. You know, yep. what some of this really squared away, how fast do you think you could become a fully qualified rescue swimmer? That's a good question. Uh, it depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, it depends on what, where you're going and the op tempo. Like I got to my first command, um, back in 2010 and I deployed out like, I think it was like four or five months later when you're on deployment, you're not doing those training flights as you used to. So there's like, you're deployed operationally, but at the same time, like during my deployment, I was part of the Fujima uh, tsunami relief. Like, so you're doing stuff in deployment, but you're not getting up that. So it just depends the fastest you could do it. I think maybe, maybe, I mean, three years, maybe, but I think that would even be a stretch to get like fully qualified. What did you do as far as the tsunami goes? So we, I was, we were actually heading from Guam to Japan and, uh, we were maybe like 300 miles off the coast and we saw basically we were coming into dinner and we saw the tsunami hit. And at that point, the Reagan wasn't out with us yet. We were kind of part of the Reagan strike group and we were waiting for this, them to come meet us up. And we were headed to Sasebo, which is very South of Japan. So we headed straight up to Japan. At that point, we were the only uh, six basically rescue swimmers with two Sierras that, that could actually do anything. So the moment we could sense and the Reagan showed up, the moment we could take off, we basically took off and and, and affected basically uh, assisting the local population however we could. Um, I mean, we, we I found a we were flying and there was like a whole house that was 50 miles out just in the water floating. It was the most. Wow disaster i've ever seen like out in the um, ocean you mean oh out in the ocean like before you even got there there was ships cargo containers like all kinds of stuff you know some stuff i won't talk about some stuff you know like i said the house but um really sad but the amount of uh stuff that we were able to do there was definitely rewarding to see that like directly um the impact you made was was something that I'll never forget. But on top of that, I'll never forget flying around and understanding like the Fukushima plant had just blown up and we didn't know about it. And they took us back and it was something straight out of a movie, movie where they kind of quarantined us and Geiger counters and started taking our flight gear, you know. Wow. Well, Fun times. Uh, what, <laughs> yeah. what was this? Like, how did the Navy split up tasks for such a a big kind of apocalyptic environment? Um, so they learned a lot from, so if you talk to any swimmers that were part of the, uh, the hurricane relief in new Orleans, um, a lot of the senior guys, a lot of lessons were learned there because I think the big issue and the way they orchestrated and the difference was the airspace was definitely an issue. Um, controlling, if you've ever flown before and anyone's ever it, controlling aircraft seems pretty simple. Um, but when you have a ton of people on a small area and orchestrating who goes where and who needs what is, is a logistics nightmare. So, um, they had a, basically a, a C2 or command and control that everyone reported to. And when you landed in a zone or you landed somewhere and they kind of, okay, who needs what, who need what's where. And you basically kind of whoever had the best resources at that time, because we would be loaded up with like, let's say women's hygiene products that needed to get somewhere um, because they didn't have them. I mean, people lost their livelihood and their entire families and they're held up in schools on Hills. Um, 
well, who needs it? So they, who needs it the most? And basically command and control a sense without getting too deep into it would say, okay, you know, uh, this aircraft needs to land here and deliver this and then go here. And it was, it was very tightly organized. We would land, go find out what they needed. Uh, if anyone was nearby that needed help and then come back and relay that back. And it was a giant orchestrated event. It was really cool to see. You being on scene though, what is it like interacting with the Japanese and like the language barrier? Uh, you get pointy talkies is what they call it. So it's basically like a piece of paper that, you know, Hey, here's, what do you need? Do you need this? Like, Hey, here's where I am wanting to help. Um, I really, um, us on that deployment, I mean, all of us, we, there was a, a huge amount of respect that we had for the Japanese people and what they went through. The big thing I would say is uh, one of our crews landed in a zone and uh, there was like just down the street, there was this uh, shopping center that was, there's a hundred people lined up. And this is maybe like four or five days after money in hand, waiting to buy whatever they could from this grocery store. And it's probably the only grocery store for a, a, a long ways. And I was thinking if that was in the U S like those windows would be freaking broken. That store would be looted and they had lost everything, families, you know, what not, what have you. And there's like a hundred people lined up waiting to just buy whatever they could. If anything, if there was going to be anything there. Yeah. So as far as like the language barrier, there was a ton of respect um, just all around. You knew you're just there. They knew you're there to help. And, and we knew that we were there to help in any way we could. Well, so. it's such an honor and respect based culture having been there. Oh, so yeah. like my, the reason I went to Guam is because I first flew out to my cutter that was in Japan. And then, okay. so I get, got to patrol out there like on in the ocean and then we come back to port there. Um, and yeah, the first thing I noticed from the Japanese people were how, well, one of the things that everyone that goes to Japan will notice is like, there's no trash anywhere but there's also no trash cans anywhere and you're yeah. like you're like what am i doing with my banana peel and i remember walking miles and miles and being like i don't know what to do with my, my banana peel and i had to <laughs> went, go into the uh i think i went to like the 7-eleven type store and yeah. i i felt bad and i wanted to be respectful so i bought a lot of things and i was like by the way can you throw this out? I <laughs> can't. And she yeah. was like, oh, like she could tell I was like a white person that couldn't speak Japanese and like, yeah, and I was ignorant. So Why is this it. dude handing me a banana? Peel? I know, it was awkward. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, like, so I guess you describing it, like, yeah, like what, how were the Japanese acting in such a, a horrific environment? Were they still like such a, a prestigious people or? Oh yeah. You, you land into, that's one we landed in, you know, schoolyards where they put pushed away, like, uh, you know, all the schoolyard equipment so you could land and you, you landed and there was an organized structure at that, wherever you landed, like everyone knew who you needed to talk to. Hey, we landed and pointy talkie. Hey, what do you guys need? Oh, you need to go talk to this guy. This guy knows English. Like, um, this is what we need. We landed somewhere and we were told for example, another for example, landed somewhere and we were told that they needed these, you know, all of these resources um, that we had on our aircraft. We landed and they wouldn't take them. We had to force them <laughs> to take what we had. Like, no, get and they lined up and we just hand over hand, like in, in a giant, like they had some guy go in, a whole bunch of people came out and they started a basically a chain gang and threw everything and we got everything in, but it was like twisting arms to get mm. them to take it. Like, no, like we landed here. We're not taking off until this is out of our aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing so. it. Like you're not doing us a favor. We need to get rid of this to take yes. off. Yeah, we need to be lighter. <laughs> yeah. uh, that would be a different story in America. I feel like, you know, you oh, got yeah. American, give me that, give me that. Where were you? It took hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like Indonesia, we had guys that were part of uh, was it Indonesia, uh, Haiti, the Haiti relief, and they would storm the helicopter the moment oh, wow. they landed. Sometimes they had kids throwing water bottles into the into the rotor arc. <laughs> well, that's so Jeez. cool. So, so you, I guess, one of the the things I'm already finding out about being a, a Navy helicopter rescue swimmer is, yeah, you get to really help in these disasters, but mm -hmm. internationally. Like yes. Cody, do you know? Was the Coast Guard aviation very involved in Haiti? I, I think it might have been. I, I think they actually were slight. There were some 
air crews deployed there. I just don't know how many. I don't know ton, anyone who was a part of it. Yeah. So, yeah. But so anyway. that's what I would say. Yeah. As I was gonna say that was what I say is a big difference is like you're from what I understand and correct like your guys bread and butter and everything you do your primary focus is aviation search and rescue and medevacs and PJs for example Air Force PJs they deal with all inland SAR stuff so that's U.S. inland SAR related stuff mostly and uh, what they call personnel rescue and combat search and rescue. The Navy, because they can kind of be everywhere, we have to be kind of, and we always say it, jack of all trades. Like we train to uh, combat search and rescue syllabus or personal rescue, and we train to maritime, but we also train to overland. Like we, we kind of, um, if you look at the organization of how they break up um, uh, responsibilities, like Coast Guard sector Guam out here, that's who we kind of get all the calls through because they're ma maritime mainly, but we get called on it. But we have to do a lot of everything. There's guys in our command right now who have had to uh, do combat search and rescue in Iraq. The, the uh, squadron I'm at right now had the Iraqi air ambulance that was an armored medevac uh, detachment that was permanently based in Iraq. Um, so. It, it, we just have to kind of do everything, which can be a lot for some people. Some people show up and never get any rescues and never do anything. And it's kind of luck of the draw, um, honestly, sometimes. Well, I think right. it's really cool. It keeps you on your toes as far as yeah. you have so many different things. It, it is different. Actually, you know, you said a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard mostly focuses on search and rescue to an extent. Um, yeah, but like I, said, that, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, yeah, I, Co Cody, explain what, what like a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard actually like does most of the time. Yeah, so basically, so yeah, we're primarily SAR. So we go to boot camp, you go to your rescue swimmer school, you get qualified in that. When you get to your unit, you know, basically what you do is you get your rescue swimmer qual. And then when you're not doing cases or training for like whatever search and rescue case, you're doing aircraft maintenance not aircraft maintenance, but more like rescue and survival systems maintenance. So yep. maintaining the life rafts, maintaining the the PFDs that we wear on the planes, um, all kinds of little stuff like that. We sew a lot. So it's a lot of like they random duties sew? like that. We sew. Oh, yeah. Dude. So we actually are in charge of sewing all the, the flight suits at the unit. So like new guy reports in, you got to sew his flight suit. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a joke because like technically, yeah, it's we're Coast Guard like helicopter rescue swimmers but the reality is the rates called aviation survival technician and yes. the, the joke that's ongoing with the other rates in the coast guard it's like they call us the aviation sewing technicians right um, oh my gosh and that certainly isn't what most <laughs> of our actual work goes in yeah. the day it is mostly focused on survival gear basically yeah the new guy's doing the sewing so a new person yeah. shows up he's sewing or she's sewing for the next like six months basically yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I was going to say something I forgot to bring up too, and a big difference, uh, as well that you bring up a good point, like new guys. So part of our pipeline is knowing everything about the aircraft. So your flight technician or, or is that what you call them? We call them crew chiefs. It's um, a, yeah. A flight mechanic. A flight mechanic. Okay. We do that role too. So okay. we have to basically, so senior guys turn into crew chiefs. Um, they don't necessarily fill the role of a rescue swimmer. So like I would, well, now they change the name of it. They call it a utility crewman. Um, but yeah, you got to know everything about it. So we do, and back in the day before, like right before I came in, rescue swimmers weren't, they didn't have a rate. They didn't have a job. They were actually maintainers that flew and held qualifications. So the guys that I got trained up by, maintenance was a huge thing. I worked on the helicopter all the time. We helped with phase maintenance. I'm sure you have the same thing in the Coast Guard. So, yeah. you know, pulling stuff off. So understanding everything about the aircraft is a huge, huge deal for us because you're the only show in town. So there's no separation. You're fulfilling the role of a crew chief or you might fill in the role of the second crewman slash swimmer. So um, if you're, uh, so I guess if you get called out for a case, you have your, your two pilots flying, or you're in, you're in 60s normally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're flying in 60, you have two pilots. Is there, t so an air crewman, so is that your crew chief who is also mm -hmm. a rescue swimmer, and then there's also another rescue swimmer slash crew chief, or how does that work? Yes, 
So the way it's broken down, you got your two pods, obviously you got two seats up front and then in back, uh, depending on the command, most of the time at most commands out there, you're going to have a crew chief who's going to be a senior guy um, who's usually got more time. Sometimes they'll be the swimmer, uh, but they will be the crew chief. They are 99.9% of the time rescue swimmers. Um, there are what they call dry crewmen who ha- are in the community who are holdovers from other stuff that don't hold the rescue swimmer call. And that's all they can do. They can be the crew chief. Um, that they're basically the flight technician, but you'll be the crew chief. And then you will have a swimmer, a rescue swimmer out here. We have what's called an SMT with us, a SAR med tech that is basically a corpsman and they can do, uh, you know, IOs, all kinds of stuff, uh, that we, you know, push, push drugs. Um, they, they hold a little bit higher medical understanding and, you know, qualifications than us. So how we work it out here is you got the crew chief that's running the hoist and run it. You call them cases. We call, you know, I'll call them a case just for simplicity's sake. Um, crew chief gets the swimmer in and out. Uh, once they get in the swimmer assist the SMT with medical related stuff. Cause they're the subject matter expert in that moment in time. Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. What's your medical background? Do they send you to EMT school or? Nope. Just, they do okay. not send you to EMT school. So, so just, is it just first aid? Basically, you do you cover first aid at all in air crew school or any? Yeah. Other? So you basic, you got basic first aid. Um, the the you have to obviously be CPR, and then there's uh, BLS, basic life okay. saving, is what yeah. they cover. Some people get EMT, um, but very rarely. That's okay. interesting. Yeah. So, so like say a case like all right, I'm going to reference the perfect storm here. I think were okay. those Navy rescue swimmers in in the perfect storm? The perfect storm, no, that's Coast Guard. That was Coast Guard, yeah. Really? Yeah. I thought those were like gray aircrafts in the movie. No. Ah. Wait, didn't wrong. they do an in-flight refuel? Like a, what do you call that? Like a, We can't hyfer. Or we can't, you, we can't in-flight refuel. You can't hyfer off a six. Probe. You can yeah. hyfer, but you can't, like, you don't have a front fuel probe. Oh, uh, okay. Was, was yeah, that, a, was that a jet probe. then that was, well, who was doing a hyfer in that movie? Uh, don't know but i, I do know that it was coast guard for really fact. interesting mm-hmm. i don't remember like the the orange and, and white on that um but anyway like a different scenario than like yeah in, uh <laughs> you know you have you have somebody that's say got like a severe laceration or a medical issue are you guys still the go-to person to take care of this or yeah we like i said we can we can easily deal with that um the big thing is is you know, life, limb, or eyesight, we can deal with that. As far as the stuff in between, like, you know, uh, other stuff, it's a little bit What about like a femur fracture? Do you have like what it takes to take care of that? Yeah, we have, well, the SMTs have traction. Um, We're, like I said, we don't hold the qualification necessarily to do that, but we, like I said, the SMTs in our, because that's what we deal with all the time, or not deal with all the time, but we have the ability to deal with that here. Gotcha. Um, But the big thing that they train for everything that you kind of deal with when you deploy is ejections. That's the main primary goal of an aviation rescue swimmer as far as SAR goes is ejections. What is that? It's like parachute entanglement stuff, all that. Yeah. Well, ejecting from, yeah, go ahead. So yeah, so everything you train for in aviation rescue swimmer school is basically scenarios where you have a pilot because you have fixed wing aircrafts on carriers all the time. And if they eject, guess who's going to go get them? The only people that can go get them because you're in the middle of, pardon my friend, can I swear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're in the middle of fucking nowhere. So, you know, in the middle of the ocean. So like Harriers, if you went on a Gator cruise, Harriers eject all the time. You know, F-35s, there's been issues, uh, you know, with certain things with them, especially on LHDs. LHDs are Gators. Is what they call them. They're basically like carrier lights. You know, they, oh, they, yeah. they're vertical takeoff and landing. So everything you're dealing with is usually an ejection or some type of aircraft mishap on deployment. That's the primary focus. Interesting. Right. So for yeah. your re- air crew rescue swimmer school, um, so in our swimmer school, we have, you know, parachute disentanglement. Mm-hmm. We spend Same about thing. a week. 
we spent about a week on it. And it, it oh, was longer like, than that. Oh, well, maybe you're I mean, right. it really isn't. It's about a week yeah. after the harder test. So it's kind of one of those like last minute things that just make us do. It's not really a huge concern for our school. I would imagine, is it a bigger focus of your, your training or is it just about kind of something you brush through and move on to the next thing? So uh, it is, uh, I, it's, there's still an evolution that is parachute disentanglement, but there yeah. are procedures as far as like, you don't, you don't go too in depth on it. They don't hammer it and beat its head horse because there's only so much you can do with someone who has a parachute on. Um, don't deploy on top of it. If you get entangled in it, here's how you get out and then um, how to disconnect it. But the big focus is entering the water triaging how to get them out so prioritization like okay what's if you have multiple people in the water and that's what we train for is multi scenarios because more than likely if there's a mishap there's probably more than likely sometimes not there's going to be multiple people so worst case first how do you triage that in the water how do you get them out how do you disentangle them and disentangling them is a huge process of going step by step. Okay, check for breathing. This is when I pulled this off. And you're dealing with all of the, you're, you're getting to learn all the aviation gear that the Navy works with. So, you know, whether they're in a naval backpack and they're a fixed wing, or they're in a integrated torso harness, which is a Air Force, uh, not an Air Force, but it was a fixed wing thing. So how do I disconnect this? You know, where do I disconnect it? Where does the O2 hose come in? You know, if you, at what point do you disconnect the O2 hose? Because if you have someone who's unconscious but breathing and you disconnect the O2 hose at the wrong moment, let's say you disconnect the seat pan. Sorry, I'm getting really into it. Uh, if you disconnect the seat pan, which is the, the base plate you know, on the pilot, if you disconnect the seat pan without disconnecting the O2 hose that goes to their mask, it'll pull them face down in the water. So, you know, steps and processes like that. I don't know if you guys deal with stuff like that, but it's mainly yeah. learning the gear. Absolutely. And yeah, like, I think a lot of, I mean, Cody, you said it, it's not like the biggest thing, but I recall somebody in my senior class getting reverted twice. Oh, he failed. You know, you get, I think three attempts at a test and he failed the parachute test three times. You guys get three? Lucky. Yeah, you get three. You get three, <laughs> but you only, you only get seven throughout the entire training. So, okay. you know, so you, you can stack them, but it's not so good for you in the long run. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and okay. we'll get into the, the rescue swimmer school in, in a second, yeah. but, uh, as far as that goes, yeah, he, he went through that parachute test, failed it, and then went, got into our class, had to work his way back up to that parachute test failed it three times and i think somehow it got reverted to the next class i don't know usually they don't do that i, I think they, I, I could be wrong i would say it kind uh, of speaks to how the coast guard kind of treats the parachute rescue you know it's like it's really not a concern because that's after you take a lot of your uh your big kind of weed out tests so like our big one is like that's after the one man test right yeah Vince? yeah yeah so you take that your big test that weeds out a lot of people and then you're doing that and they kind of they want you to pass at that point you know mostly but I guess if you can't get you, it done, then you can't get it done. You always get to a certain point and it just, you know, it, with any school, there's a certain point where you understand that they're going to make it for you. That you can, you can have them grasp the concepts that you throw at them if they make it to a certain point. There's always that like turnaround point where it's like, okay, if they don't get here, they're probably not going to make it for the rest of the Yeah. Life. Yeah. Um, so I'm, um, it's, it's human beings are the same. But that said, yeah, the parachute test certainly was the more the most step by step process of any of the 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 tests that we go through. Like some are, are yeah. definitely more physically challenging as far as it's okay. te technically involved. Yeah, it's the most technically involved test we have. 100%. Yeah. How do they have you guys do it, Cody? Uh, I don't well, know, like, remember? We've, we've been out for a while, so like it's, it'll be fun to try to <laughs> yeah. let's try to remember so, the step by step process. I'm, no, I have no idea about the step-by-step -step process. Yeah. Like, I could not remember any steps. But, um, yeah, I couldn't even tell you, honestly. The okay. big thing is, um, I'm trying to think. We well, have these no, steps. No, I, no, I want to say I'm it was I'm going like, to go through it. I want to start. Like, I, I, we're, we're going to butcher <laughs> right. this. And, and, and current I'll rescue swimmers, we do, as a, as we do a, apologize. A yeah, we, yeah. we apologize. Cause, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we apologize because it's been a while. But um, we're, we're, in, we're in college now. We study yeah, other stuff. And, and nice. whoever, whoever's an airman, rescue swimmer, you know, don't take this to, to Q and then and consult actual aviation survival technicians currently in the Coast Guard for, for this. So that's my uh, fair warning. Yeah, run through a uh, run run through a rescue summer school test. Yeah. 
Yeah. So how they do parachute disentanglement is they basically take a parachute without any of the lane shroud lines that aren't sewn into the chute. So they bring the chute down. You have someone, you have the apex, which is the very center of the parachute. And each candidate goes around the parachute and you spread the parachute out completely is what we do. So the entire time they're treading water, holding up this parachute in the water, which is a challenge within itself. And then every person takes a turn entering the parachute and you basically, they turn over onto their back and they, what they're taught is they grab a shroud line and they follow that shroud line to the apex and you grab the shroud line and you punch up to create an air pocket. So this is like worst case scenario, you're under the parachute. So all of the other swimmers are holding the parachute basically depending on how horrible of a class it is. Um, They're holding up the parachute. Sometimes you'll make them just, you know, hands out of the water or elbows out of the water. So are they, are they holding it with fins on or are they just treading with, okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they have fins. That would be because I mean, if you've got a class of like 20 people or something like that, like you have, they're holding it up and every single person has to go through. Okay. So if someone messes up, like it's going to take longer. So they're holding up the parachute and then the first person goes, basically enters the parachute, says he's going to enter the parachute. He calls out his, his name and then punches up, grabs, punches up, grabs, punches up till he gets to the apex. And then he follows another shroud line. Once he finds the apex, which is where all everything intertwines, he grabs another shroud line and goes out, making sure he's going out. It doesn't matter where he comes out necessarily, but he grabs a shroud line and punches out until he exits. And then he says he's clear. And then he swims around to his spot grabs parachute and the next person goes yeah okay so ours is that the actual test that you guys do so it's a familiarization it is okay. gradable but i mean you can teach someone it no easy, so right? we, we did so that as well yeah we do okay. that but ours is, is different that we do have a test on that where it's just okay. you so we'll uh practice it in a similar fashion to that and then okay. we'll have to uh you know like we'll practice it maybe like on a monday or tuesday and then maybe Thursday, Friday, on Thursday, we start the test. So you'll just, everyone's waiting in the locker room and one guy at a time will go out, take the test and they'll have to, uh, you know, do the whole, all the steps. So get in there, find the shroud line, get your, get your, uh, whoever's the down aviator. You got to pull them out, do all the steps, get them into the helicopter. So it's like a full on test. Okay. Um, so I guess that would be the only difference, but the thing is, it's is it so a ballooned parachute on top of him. Yes, it's so it's, okay. it's a balloon on top of him, and the, so you have to go under there, get him, punch your way out. I remember all that. Um, wait, 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 wait! You guys go under the no, hold on, hold on, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. no. So we, this is exactly, it's coming back to me now. So we grab right. the shroud line and we pull right. him out. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And then we put him in a tow, <laughs> disconnect him with the steps, and then we have to hoist him into the helicopter. So yeah. So that was what I just described was parachute disentanglements, uh, or or parachute basically you know, entanglement if you were to get in there. But as far as, because we deal with parachutes all the time, we would do multis and we deal with like integrated torso harness, stuff like that. Every single time we do a multi evolution that is graded and more than likely someone's going to have a parachute. Right. So as far as that, like if they have a naval backpack that, you know, you have to take off a different way than an integrated torso harness. So like what I talked about before. So as far as grading the student he's graded on getting it off correctly almost every time and whether it be ballooned and like i said you grab the shroud line and you pull it and if you do it right and i always taught students this too if you do it right and you're pulling him towards basically the edge away from the apex the parachute does like a magic thing where it just kind of like folds over the person you actually don't like a lot of people get so caught up and like i gotta like pull the parachute over him and if it's ballooned or over him no, you really, if you pull the parachute and there's an air pocket in there and you pull them out, the apex will sink on the opposite side and it'll actually just kind of flow over him in, in a, in a right way. I've had a ton of experience doing obviously teaching it. One thing I recall being really funny with the parachute test is yeah, you know, you usually, when it comes down to, to the testing day, you, you get on at the pool deck and they've already set up an instructor as the, the downed aviator in the yep. parachute, in the parachute, but What's kind of funny is it's it's completely more or less subjective, not subjective, but like it's the luck of the draw as far as, you know, it's it's a crumbling deck of cars more or less. Right. Like the parachute, however, it's set up. It's not always the same for every student. They try to spread oh, yeah. it out as much as they can. But 
the way the instructors actually tangled within all the the chords always varies from student to student and i I recall like one of my i think it was like one of the practice tests but you know there's usually always a safety instructor when you're you're going Mm -hmm. through the, the the test and i recall you know at this point it's later for us in the school so we're starting to connect a little bit more with the with the instructor and not not to say they they're fraternizing in any way but you know there, there is that relationship built and i recall looking at my survive and it was the worst mess i've ever seen in like other practices and i was like oh uh-huh. and i recall like <laughs> going underwater and starting the process of disentanglement and Wait, looking real quick you yeah. didn't go underwater with a parachute did you no 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 so this is the, okay okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, so basically what we do is you you get him in a tow you pull yep. the shroud line get him in a tow mm-hmm. and then we had the parachute we used in a school had these like disconnection points you disconnect everything like four or five different points mm-hmm. and at that point the parachute would kind of fall to the wayside yep. but the the the, uh, the actual shroud lines and all that extra untangled. crap is tangled around his legs and waist so that's yes. kind of and then at that point we go under our survivor to clear clear the lines okay yeah okay. yeah and uh, that was. That was the stage I guess I was at. And I recall going under and, you know, you, you can you can go under. You don't have to always do it in one breath. But I, I tended to try to clear it all in one breath because I think uh-huh. it was time or something. And I recall, like, dealing with it. And and just the way this parachute was towing the instructor down was, like, none I'd ever experienced before. And I recall just being underwater, like, in second, like, a, a lot of seconds going by. And I'm like, God damn, this is this is tangled as hell. And I recall like looking at the safety instructor up there and he just like, he was like, <laughs> like yeah, I think he took his stork a lot. I was just like, oh, like dude, that's a mess. <laughs> and he was just like shaking his head like, oh, <laughs> like oh. haven't seen it like that before. And I was like, this is terrible. Um, how do you but, guys, once you get the connection points off, how do you guys disentangle the person from like, what's the process that you guys go through? if you remember yeah it's pretty simple basically what we do is we have uh we go under our survivor you basically put your head on your uh your survivor's butt and you're just oh, okay. still towing him and then you're using your hands to kind of free the lines as much as we, you can we used to call that spinal highway do you yeah guys call that's what that? it's called it's fine okay. it's coming back yeah spinal highway we, same thing we took spinal highway away we don't okay. use it anymore uh it's it's a it's it used to be an option uh what we do is we do arms and legs. So we basically just stay, we never go under the water. Um, we just tow, if you tow the person, it kind of planes them out and then you start at the arms and you, you do clear, like a side clear. toe. Uh, so we use, tra- so we just use a collar toe usually. Okay. And yeah. Positive control, sweeping the arm, swapping hands, keeping control yep. of the gear. And basically you sweep the arm until it's clear, you sweep. So it starts at the chest, then you do the arms and then you go down to the legs. And right. as you get to the eggs, it, legs, it kind of frees up. Yeah. Um, but I uh, personally, I hate, I, I came in when we had spinal highway. I hated spinal highway. I hated it. It's, it's so much harder. It um, makes everything more complicated. So yeah, I think the main reason in swimmer school that we continue to use it, if I'm sure they still use it now, is just to make mm-hmm. everything harder. They wanted yep, to make the course. test that much harder. Yeah. So <laughs> obviously it's like you could just go on the side of your survivor, put them in a color toe and just clear lines. And they yeah. even said that I think at one point, but they were like, well, we got to make it so you can't breathe at some Worst point. Worst case scenario. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I recall an instructor specifically showing us a different technique, just wrapping uh, the material at like the hip to tow yeah. the survivor yep. and it clearing yep. the legs. And he's like, yeah, you That's never actually have to do what we're doing right now, but we want to make exactly this a freaking nightmare for you. Guys. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just basically, we would, t- we would, uh, you basically, what we do is we take the arm, what we would teach them, you take the material of their arm and you wrap once, because the arm's clear and you don't want it to kind of be, especially if they're unconscious. So you wrap that material of the arm and then you take the actual flight suit or whatever they have in the pant leg and then you clear the leg with the other arm. So now you're just kind of like towing them this way and they're basically horizontal or, yeah, horizontal like this. Yeah, and their legs are here, heads there, and you're just sweeping that leg, and then you just spin them around, and do the same thing. Now, what would you say is the most challenging test in Navy Rescue Swimmer School? Mm, so, uh, going through myself, uh, I don't know. Just every everything's a little different for everyone. Um, I would say the the big thing that uh, people usually fail on. Um, my own experience is uh breaks holds escapes and releases 
And um, that's just water because that's very early on. Um, people have a hard time with that as far as like going under the water. I Since then, we've adopted the way that you guys do it. Before we used to do the whole suck, tuck and duck, go under. And, you know, now we've, we've transitioned to, I believe what you guys still do, which is underwater jujitsu, essentially. Um, you don't so, go under the water. Did you guys have that when you were so in? So when we, when we went through, and so I went through in 2013, Vince went through late 2013, 2014. Okay. We were doing suck, tuck and duck. Okay. Um, so recently we've you heard, watching yeah. suck, duck and duck. And sorry, it's just a suck, duck and yeah. duck is like, you take a breath in, you tuck your chin so they don't collapse your airway and then you go under the water. Yeah. And, and like the rationale behind that is when you go underwater, usually a survivor is going to kind of let go, free up and down. yeah. So yeah, we don't, we, we've heard about the underwater jujitsu, but we haven't really seen it or heard and talked to anyone who actually has done it before. So okay. uh, were you, uh, when you were an instructor, were you guys teaching that or no, you were no, still doing something uh, when I got out here to Guam, um, is when they transitioned into it. Uh, so I, I came out here, had to learn it all. And now that's the standard. Now, um, the big thing is you don't go into the water. I'm sure you heard. Um, yeah, which is, it makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, like I understand the process because I practice jujitsu on the side. So the whole point is like, just the biggest difference is they made a couple of things more simple as far as the escapes and the releases. So the escape is getting away is what I always tell, tell people. And the release is releasing their grasp and then keeping positive control of your survivor and gaining control of them. Um, if you're afraid of losing them, but as far as like the, I, the reason why they shifted to this process and not going to the water is because there were issues of guys in like Gumby suits. And if you've ever been, you know, what a Gumby suit is right. Yeah, um, if you're, it's like one of those like kind of survival sh- suits that are really oh, it's quite inflated. Right? Yeah. yeah, well, it's not really necessarily inflated, but it's it's a huge thick, very buoyant. Per- oh, very buoyant. So if yeah. you're if you're getting a guy in a in a gumby suit, you're going to be in a dry suit. Your buoyancy is going to be up there. Their buoyancy is going to be up there, and uh, it's it's going to be hard to get under the water. That's it true. really is. Yeah. So it's it's teaching people to deal. And again, the worst case scenario of just getting them off. Mm, Not a lot's changed. It's just suck, tuck. And then like, for example, the front head hold escape is you straight just throw them in the direction you're looking. Instead okay, of messing with like, pressure points. No drop. pressure points. You, yeah. still, you, you can use pressure points if you yeah. want. The big change too is the combative survivor. I don't know if you guys did it where you went yeah. under the water and then attacked them mm-hmm. for that. Um, yeah. Uncooperative combative is what they call it. Um, now you're, you're approaching them. You're approaching them on the surface from the front. Okay. Yes. Oh, all right. That's yeah. cool. So yeah. you're basically what you're doing is, in a sense is you, you pick a dominant leg, dominant hand, you're approaching them and then you're timing. They're going to be fuck, fucking flailing at you or whatever. They're trying to get you. You're defending them off. You're timing their arm and you're sliding out, dominating that one arm and swinging them around to expose their back. Okay. Oh, cool. So cool. Yeah. you're basically gaining control of the situation without punching them in the face, which I think is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, are you talking about, about the, are you referencing the oh, guardian? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that Hodge? Airman, Airman Hodge. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you disagree with the punching in the face or you think it should uh, be standard? <laughs> I would, uh, we always talked about it too. It's like, if someone's actually like, combative or they're not you can't get control of them we would always just say like well i'll just wait till you tire out or you pass out and then i'll come grab you <laughs> like yeah, i'm yeah. not gonna you know straight up. but with this you can what we train to it now is we actually pair up swimmers without masks on and they just have fins and we call it patty cake because what it turns into is like you doing this and the whole it's basically we do jujitsu in the water where you have to the the one swimmer's doing combative survivor procedures on you and the other one's doing it on the other. So whoever gets the person's back wins. Oh, how that's cool. That's, yeah. So now it's you're basically in a in a jujitsu match in the water and you gotta you gotta dominate that arm while the other person's trying to dominate your arm. So is is would there be a huge benefit in knowing and practicing jujitsu before going to these schools or, or to Navy? summer school or is it not really related like I don't uh, know, it's not the same I, as far as that maybe there's some weird stuff about it that doesn't 
play into it. I know the guy that did create these procedures um, was a, I think he's a black belt now in jujitsu. I think I know him. I think we talked about oh, yeah. him on the previous okay. podcast with uh, Caleb okay. Flippin. So uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, Mayava, but I won't say his okay. whole name, but like, uh, but okay. yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think he, he's probably. Well, so now, did they so. implement them separately in the Navy and the Coast Guard or is it the same guy? Is that. Uh, so they implemented them in the Coast Guard and then we adopted them. So I think. Okay. I know so yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So this is the videos that we have that we train new guys on are that guy that you guys right. are talking. Well, about. that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Big, big, tall. By big, I don't mean like that he's stocky, jack, but got he's, some he's sleeves jack. on. He's lengthy, very tall, like six, four or something. Um, Bald head. Yeah. And, and just, he was, so he was, when I was going through like the program of becoming a rescue swimmer, we had the airman program. So you'd go to an air station and work under the rescue swimmers. And he was a second class at that time. Uh, okay. Yeah. And just scared the crap out of me. Oh my God. <laughs> Dude, like whenever, like, oh man, we, we better had our stuff like squared away when he would walk in. Cause I was like. He was the one that I, sh- oh, I shouldn't say that. Nah, I won't say it, but we, I'll say it. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he had us like doing ju- I, as he was big on punishment. So, you know, like if oh, yeah. me- one of one of the I think the punishment was we, we couldn't tread water with bricks, actually two bricks with no fins um, because he could <laughs> very well um, easily with his big old feet. So uh, yeah. we couldn't do it. And he's like, if you don't if you don't keep those two bricks above water for i want to i want to say like 30 to a minute he's like yeah you guys have to do a thousand push-ups and i want to say he said like and a thousand sit-ups before mm. you leave the day today and it was four <laughs> oh <my laughs> and we were gosh. like and this is after beating us in like on a workout and in the pool and we were like okay and we didn't make it so <laughs> we were there i think it was like I think it was like seven or eight at night or something. It, it was late. Okay. And the yeah. senior chief, who's like not even part really so much of the shop, he's part of the command. So he's not really yeah. in the rescue swimmer environment per se. Um, but the the senior chief rescue swimmer happened to walk by mm-hmm. and he's such a sweetheart. And he goes like, he kind of got a smirk. He's like, what's going on, boys? And we're just like, dude, our face is like flush. It's just not healthy at this point. You could tell the pushups, <laughs> like we got the form kind of, but it's like something. Like things are starting to squeak, you know, like it's rusty. <laughs> like yeah, the joints yeah. are no longer moving properly. And he, <laughs> he goes like, what are you guys doing? We're just like completing our requirements. And he goes like, what do you mean requirements? And we got, we're like, we got to do a thousand pushups and a thousand sit-ups. He goes like, what are you at? And like, we had like a sheet and we're like, uh, well, I've got like 750. He's got 820. He's got like <laughs> 610. And then uh, he goes like, oh, and why are you guys doing this? Because like, that's not part of anything. <laughs> and he goes like, why are you guys yeah. doing this? We were like, well, you know, we were told. Because? Because, you know, the guy that does jujitsu would jujitsu us if we didn't. <laughs> no, but uh, but yeah, and he, he just goes like, hold on a second. And that guy was long gone. He was, you know, having dinner probably with his family at this point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the the night swimmers were there and he goes, he goes like, are they, let's just, let's just cut this this is done. We're not doing this. Like, <laughs> yeah. dude. Their shoulders popping out of their sock. It's like, yeah. we need, we need these guys to keep working out. <laughs> <laughs> there so definitely is it. that. Yeah. There definitely is that with, uh, you know, you, you, you have, we, we, we had a name for it. It was called, and I wouldn't, I would, I would label that as that. There is a standard operating procedures that every instructor like goes by. We call it the RSSTP. So this is what you're allowed to do. This is what you're not allowed to do. Um, there's a huge case study back in the day that we always, when we go through rescue swimmer instructor school that we go over, it's called the Marecki incident is basically these instructors killed the student. It, it, it was horrible. The dudes went, yeah. I, one of the dudes went to jail. Um, they played what's called sharks, sharks and minnows, which you can no longer do. I'm sure you've heard of it. I yeah. Mean, no. We used to do it well, too. It was banned from our school. Wait, yep, so, so, so you're get, saying a Navy uh, rescue swimmer instructor happened to, you know, kill a candidate with yep. this sharks and minnows can you explain what mm-hmm. that is so sharks and minnows is basically the instructors are are the sharks um and you have minnows and basically you got to make it from one end of the pool to the other uh, underwater um is what the way the way i had always in when i swam that's how we played it we we're not allowed to play it in the navy so i don't know if they did it differently back in the day mind you this is back in the 80s that this happened yeah so there was this one candidate that was um, a little bit weaker and they basically, he 
they drug him in the water and the instructors kept drown, basically dragging him under the water. And they made the entire class basically about face turn around. And I think they made him sing a song. I can't remember what it is while they basically kept pulling this kid under the water and he, he eventually died. Um, let me, let me first and foremost say like that is, there has never been an incident since then. Those instructors should be freaking. they put their punishment was, was well due. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but, and everyone that was around that, that knew it was happening. Um, they were out of line and they got punished. I think the guy who did it ended up going to jail. Um, was it, but was it cause they I, didn't like the kid or what do you think it was? It, was it definitely was. Um, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, and let me, let me just preface it with this. There's going to be students that are better at something than other. And some that you as an instructor, your personality necessarily doesn't fit with, which is fine, but that doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter who you like, who you don't like, you're there to train students. There are some instructors that are better at separating that than others, um, wholeheartedly, but the basic premise of it. And what I will say is, and my wife gave me shit all the time. I call it, we call it instructor mode, basically where you can turn it on really quick and then literally turn around and start laughing. Like it's just something that you deal with it. So on and so forth. And my wife gave me crap about it one time because she started, basically I came home from work and apparently I didn't flip that switch off. And I went from like zero to a hundred in like two seconds. And she looks at me, she goes, I am not one of your rescue swimmer students. And I literally was like, yeah, you're right. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they what was it like the kids, funny. the kids toys were laying around or like, <laughs> I subbed like that. You yeah. heard him knocking on the door. Yeah. I, I can't remember. It was a while ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, there is, there are instructors that are better than others. Um, just like in any job and, and making that separation. That's why I ended up while I was an instructor, I, I pursued my degree in psychology and got it in psychology because understanding the inner workings of what motivates students, what they do, how they do certain things, how to communicate better. Like that really drove me to get my BS in psychology. Um, mm. And it made me a better instructor, I think. What yeah, kind of, my... what kind of revelations would you say you've come to by studying that and, you know, yeah, noticing these candidates on a day-to-day -day basis? So the big thing I would say is, uh, the difference between authoritarian rule and authoritative basically uh, styles of it's a parenting style. Um, so authoritarian rule, and I'm sure you've seen it. Um, you're going to do what I say, no matter what I say, and you will get punished and I won't tell you why. Um, it's all the time. You're going to do this and this is why. Uh, I came in I will say under that mindset, like I'm an instructor, you're going to listen to me. This is what you're going to do. Um, and I shifted that. Yeah. I still held people accountable. I still turned on, you know, you still got to give that tough love where necessary. And that's what it was, was tough love, but authoritative, you know, parenting style. And it's, it sounds stupid that I'm calling it it's parenting style, but it applies to any type of mentorship or leadership. It's a leadership style too, um, is, I'm still going to correct where necessary. I'll, and, and there's again, to fall back and not to digress too far. There's a spectrum. A lot of people think it's just an on and off switch. There's instructor on and off where they're just yelling at you and then they're not, and they're not talking to you, but there's varying degrees of how, where you apply pressure. And if you just turn it on or off, you'll, you'll, you can hurt students, break, you know, in a sense or turn them sour. So that spectrum applied to an authoritative type of leadership is I'm going to win you over to my side by explaining why you're doing what you're doing. And if something doesn't make sense, I, I have failed as an instructor, not explaining to that properly to you. If you don't understand something, it's not because you're a bad learner. It's because I'm a bad teacher. And I need to make sure that you understand it. Now, there are those cases where people just aren't physically apt. And sometimes my teaching style doesn't best appropriate, doesn't best communicate to some a student. Uh, 
So I might have to get another instructor who teaches a little different to talk to this student and teach him. So when someone would fail something, we would always do remediation and remediation is always with a different instructor mm. because that instructor teaching, they might not be communicating it the way that that student needs to hear it. And That's a lot of times, so it, a lot of times that fixed it because that instructor is getting frustrated because his teaching style necessarily isn't getting through to them. And now you got a new guy and I'd see it all the time. I'd be teaching a student and he's not getting, not, not get, get it. You do remediation, someone else tests him again and he passes. What would you say was your teaching style? Uh, I was more disappointed dad. <laughs> disappointed dad. Is that what you just said? Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> I mean, I would still, I would still, you know, crank it up, especially when they were, uh, not performing. Um, but it wasn't like I wouldn't go crazy. Um, I, I found the best way, especially like during PT when someone wasn't uh, performing. And I learned this from my senior chief too, um, who's a great guy. Uh, love him to death. He's retired. Um, but talking to them, when you're just talking to someone, when the moment you start screaming at someone, people are going to tune you out. They're just going to tune you out, especially when shit's hard and it hits the fan and they're, you know, let's say you're on a long run or they're in the leaning rest for a long period of time. Those are like the best learning experiences because you can get down and basically be like, look, and just talk to them in a calm voice. And that in a sense, and again, me personally, I think that fucks with their head more because now, you know, if I would lean down sometimes and just be like, Hey, um, this, this might not be for you. I think you need to go to lunch and seriously readdress where you're at right now. Um, you're not in physical shape and I'm not going to sugarcoat it for what's going to happen next. So, uh, go to lunch. Let me know what you want to think. Let me know what you want to do. And a lot of times that would just, I mean, if the seed was already there, that would just, you talk about the seed, like that seed of like, do I want to quit? Do I want to quit? You'd see it and you would know kind of, you wouldn't know but that would basically unfold them if they were, if that seed was there, Hey, this, this isn't for me. Mm. But like, and not to challenge you too much, but no, is that like your government. place as an instructor to, to really push a student to, no. to quit? No. So uh, like I said, I would never push them to quit. You create challenging experiences to expose weaknesses um, and try and work those weaknesses out. If they can't do that, that's why there's the DOR policy. Yep. We never make drop anyone, on request, by the way. Yeah, drop, yeah, sorry, drop on request. Yep. Um, there's drop on request, and then there's training timeout. Way different. Training timeout is basically, I don't understand what's happening. You're not quitting. Like, I just don't know what's going on. Nothing's making sense. Could you please explain this a little bit more? This is completely fine. Yep. Um, but drop on request is, Which is it's quitting, all voluntary. Sorry. Yeah, it's quitting. Yeah. So it's all voluntary. If if it's not for you, um, and that's, I think, the misconception is instructors try to make you quit. No, um, we see weak points. We know the syllabus. We'll never make you quit, but we'll be honest with you. You know, this might not be for you, and I want you to readdress your position here. And there were people that I thought were like, you know what, they might not make it. Um, but you never know. You never know the instructor. I would, I would basically, Hey, you can barely do flutter kicks, man. We're about to go do some, some basically SB and C some underwaters and, and you're having a hard time just making it through one underwater swim. Uh, you might want to readdress this. And they, they came back and they're like, Nope, I'm gonna stick it out. And they made it through. Mm. They made it through. Um, now, yeah. That's a question. Like uh, gaining seniority as an instructor, would you eventually would, like, would you reach a point where you, you could kind of predict who would pass and fail pretty early on within the candidate's journey through the program. No. Never. No. You could, you you could for certain people, but in the end, you never know. Interesting. You 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 never know. Some some people surprise you. Yeah. Some um, people really surprise you. Is there like underground betting as instructors going on? Like, I bet you don't make it. <laughs> but that, I guess not because then I would corrupt who would actually pass and fail. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Um, there, there's obviously talk, like we would have, you know, morning meetings. Hey, this is what we got going on as far as, you know, you got this guy. 
uh, who's struggling with this. It would never be a, Hey, we got this guy who can't do an under who's having a hard time doing underwaters. Uh, let's try and get him to fail. Mm. It's what resources do we need to allow him to succeed? It was never, Hey, this is weak point. Let's make it worse to get him to quit mm. ever. But do you ever challenge yeah. that weak point? You know, like, like specifically because oh, yeah. you know he has it. Yeah. So you're, you will challenge it um, via the evolutions that you have. So if someone for, you know, for example, uh, we had a student that just couldn't triage properly. He made, he was good at an very strong dude when it comes to applying the techniques. He just couldn't, couldn't in a sense, uh, prioritize who to get out first. Mm. So on his final multi, we created a situation where it evolved. Um, and it, as it evolved, he, and, and it, with anything, it will evolve. You give them a certain prescription, you give them a certain procedure. We knew the weak point. We gave him remediation on that weak point, And then we gave him the scenario again. And it got to the point where if anything changed, he fell apart. He mm -hmm. couldn't do it properly. If anything changed within the scenario, if someone went from not breathing or br went from breathing to not breathing, he just fell apart. Hmm. Not necessarily like, but just couldn't mentally make that shift. Yeah. One of uh, the, the, the really heartbreaking things of my experience going through the rescue swimmer school was that half of my class failed on the very final multi and that rarely happens yep. usually if you made it that far you're usually going to pass the final test right it's just they kind of combine a lot of things i'm not going to say specifically what happens but um they combine a lot of things and yeah for some reason these these guys uh fell apart and how they did fall apart two of them at least i know is yeah i guess it was in a sense the triage but they missed like two survivors, Step. like, like off oh, the they bat. they just skipped them? No, they, as in like, like, <laughs> you know, like two were, were actively like, um, in distress, if you will. Okay. And they need buoyancy, right? So like, that's one of the first things. So they did Yeah. And number and one, I guess, survival. <laughs> yeah. And I guess they would like, I don't know if this happened twice. I'm assuming it couldn't happen because you get to try twice, I think, or something like that for the mm -hmm. final one. Um, mm -hmm. and I guess see, they, that didn't happen the second time, but I know the first time they straight up missed like one of the survivors as in like and you know it's a it's a it's a pool that's 25 meters by 25 meters and it's deep right but i think it's slightly dark in there at that point but you see you clearly see the whole pool deck when you're on the tower about to launch and, and start this yeah. thing so and people if they aren't are illuminated like if it's at night yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's obvious it's insane. It, yeah it was it's it wasn't that dark it wasn't that dark where yeah. like you needed they're never gonna room. like hide i don't know if it's like, no. we're never gonna hide someone in a corner in a dark room and be like you missed him like exactly. yeah he's there bro. and like that's yeah, where like, like he's in the pool yeah. <laughs> that's why i was he's go, screaming I was like, over there save me go get yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah somehow they completely missed giving buoyancy to some of the survivors because they're like you know at the end of the test they're like what you why, why didn't you attend to like the, the, these survivors? And they were saying like, I didn't even see him. Like, and they're like, well, he's drowned now. Like it's too late. You, you dealt with the, like, I won't say specifically who, but like one of the other survivors instead of main, like addressing this issue. Um, and they, yeah, it was kind of sad. And, and me personally, I was like, how is that what made you fail? I was, and then these are good friends of mine. I was really frustrated. I was like, but really like what you didn't look, I don't understand. Like, first of all, personally, I would, kind of peak as you're getting out on the pool deck right you're, you're kind of like yeah you, you know let's yeah. be real that you're not out there with blind like you're counting how many people are in the water immediately yeah i'm like, yeah, like yeah, first thing i'm like okay this all right that's what i'm dealing with all right like technically you're supposed to be eyes front right but like you all right i, I see what's going on here um yeah yeah and that's that's one thing i say though that for example with that uh example is that i gave earlier and what you just pointed out was the ability to um, step outside, not, not just yourself, but people get tunnel vision. That's what screws them. They get focused on one point and they forget about the big picture. Um, with that, like, yeah, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna look around like, yeah, they're going to tell you like the eyes forward, but guess what? If, if it's dark, you're going to look around and see what's there. You're going to help yourself out. Everyone knows that. Um, but as far as, as that, the big thing when they enter the water and like you said, forgetting about flotation, 
you have to be able and with pilots, for example, training with pilots all the time, they have a constant scan of their instruments and their gauges. And if you get, if the pilots get deadlocked on one instrument or one gauge, that's how they kill everyone is they forget about the big picture, where they are, their orientation, you know, where their attitude is, stuff like that. And just like a swimmer, if you get dead locked on what you're doing in that moment of time. If you grab a survivor, he's your first survivor and you just get, go through the steps dummy style and forget about everything around you. That's an issue. And that's where people fail is they get that tunnel vision on one specific task without every once in a while, in a sense, a scan stepping out. Hey, what's that survivor going on over there? What's the status? Okay. He doesn't have flotation. I have this guy that also doesn't have flotation. I need to, I know I need to go through the steps, but at a certain point, I need to get him flotation, make sure he's good and then get to that guy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, one, another thing that was interesting, I think, you know, Cody, if you recall near the end of those multis or even in the beginning, more or less of those multis, multiple survivor scenarios, uh, you get to watch your classmates go through the multis just to kind of learn and, and then I guess see okay. them as well. Um, so you're just standing poolside. You know, sometimes you're doing workouts as you do that, but you get to observe. And one thing I did notice on some of those candidates near the end, and it was sad that they made it that far. And like, like I fi- I really saw a panic in their eyes when dealing with those combative survivors. And I was like, wow, mm-hmm. really? You made it past like the, the one man in, and still you could see when the, the instructor was wrapping their arms around them or about to, their eyes would like just be wide open and like you could see the fear and the panic um, in their yeah. eyes. And I was like, Ooh, yeah, that's like, I was like, I'm not an instructor or, or ever will be, but like in my mind, I was like, Ooh, that's, that's probably not something that should be out in the fleet, you know? Um, yeah. So in regards to that and, and, and leaning more on, uh, psychology, you know, my psychology background is there's a difference between like declarative memory and procedural memory. And what you're trying to do in rescue swimmer school is breed in uh, procedural memory. Procedural memory is basically uh, your, the inner parts of your brain are common sense stuff that, that you would call that you just do. For example, when you learn to ride a bike, that goes from declarative memory to your procedural memory. Once you learn how to bike, ride a bike, you can jump on and you're not thinking, okay, I need to put this much pressure on my pedal. And I would tell the students this time, that's what we're doing. I'm not going to put this much pressure, pressure on the pedal and then lift this foot. Or do you guys know how to drive manual cars? Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. So when you jump in a manual car, you don't think, okay, I got to put out this much clutch and this much gas. You get in and you do it because it's become ingrained as what they call procedural memory. There's a uh, problems with that that can occur if not trained effectively for example uh, there's a good video out there of a guy talking about this exact thing he grabbed people who knew how to ride a bike and he changed the way the handlebars turned so when you turn to the right the wheel turned to the left and when you turn to the left the wheel turned to the right and he would pay them. He's like, I'll pay you a hundred dollars. If you can basically take this bike from here to there. And it was maybe, maybe 20 feet and they couldn't do it. No one could do it because their <laughs> procedural memory was so ingrained on how to ride a bike that they just, they couldn't bring it outside into what they call declarative memory, which is more like thought process when you're learning. Hmm. Okay. I need to focus on what I'm doing. I need to actually, okay, put this much pressure into the clutch and put this much into the gas, or I need to put this much pressure in the handlebar and pull it out. Um, so when you're talking about that fear in your eyes, what I want to point out here is everyone's everyone experiences some kind of startle fear or anything. If you're in that situation, if someone's going to jump you, like if they say they weren't scared, they're fucking lying to you. (laughs) It's not a thing. It's just where you go from there. Uh, I I forget who, what I think it was um, Aristotle, you know, training is, is it's habitual. It, you know, you don't, you don't rise to the level of, the expectations, you fall to the level of your training. So with that, if you don't train it right and train it effectively and ingrain that into a procedural memory, you will fail. And that's how you know when dudes get to their multi, they haven't been studying, they haven't been practicing this, and it was not processed into that mental Mm -hmm. pipeline. But how would would procedural and declarative memory 
uh, link with with a panicking candidate, like I just was saying. Uh, so so you know, in a sense, you have your you know sympathetic nervous system, and then you have you know so in that you're responding, you're responding to what's going on. Um, and if you haven't trained right or trained effectively, you're going to fall back on improper training. Um, again, why, why, you know, seals are so good at what they do. They just be in what they do over and over again so they can react. Um, perfect example. Uh, have you heard of Colonel John Boyd and the OODA loop? Yeah, I've heard about it, but no, I don't okay. know. The history. So the OODA loop is, it was a during, I might be wrong. I'm like Korea. Um, I think it was Korea, Vietnam. They figured out that the U S air force, uh, fighter jets had a kill rate of nine, I think it was like 10 to one. So for every 10 aircraft that U S fighter jets took out, they only took out one of theirs, which was weird because the MIGs at that time that they had were faster. What's a MIG? Uh, so it's a jet. It's a, it's basically a Russian jet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they, you know, the Koreans had used them that it was, it was faster. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, like it was better at that time because it was all about speed, but what the U S aircraft had was it had a glass dome cockpit that had a better field of view and it had hydro mechanical controls. So you were able to maneuver more. So he found out why was because of this OODA loop. And this has played into a lot of uh, basically, you know, uh, special operations use it. Uh, and this OODA loop is basically observe, orient, decide, act. That's what OODA, O-O-D-A. Anything you do, let's say I'm approaching a survivor, or let's say someone's about to shoot me or whatever. You observe what they're doing. You orient yourself in a way to approach the situation. You decide what you're going to do, and then you act on that decision. Because what Colonel Boyd found out was because they had better situational awareness of what was going on, they had a bigger picture via their cockpit, and they could maneuver faster, they were taking their OODA loop and placing it with inside the basically the MIGS pilot, and now they dominated the airspace because now the MIG was reacting to everything that they did. Mm. So with any situation, if you can out, and I always say outmaneuver, you hear it all the time. Like if you can outmaneuver whatever object, person, uh, thing, you control that situation because now they are reacting to your inputs. So if you don't have the proper training, you don't have that procedural learning, you can't uh, decide what to do and react. If you cycle through your OODA loop faster, you will dominate that situation. So with like combative survivor, what you talked about, uh, if they don't have that procedural memory and they can't get through that fast enough, in a sense, you're now reacting to the survivor and the survivor dominates the situation. If you blank out, they're going to control everything. If you don't know what to do and that isn't in a reactionary state, it's it's just not going to happen. Well, it seemed like more of a fight or flight type of situation that they would oh, currently is. hit because it seemed at that point it was a it was a lack of oxygen. It was a panicking primal instinct, and that's where they started to lose their procedural memory is because yeah. they were they were no longer even able to ride that bicycle like you said they were it, it's i need to get off this bicycle because this bicycle is underwater and that plays into it too it's comfortability in the water too that's why most of, i'm sure what it is uh the comfortability in the water that's why a lot of people don't pass with the brakes full escapes and releases when i went through is because they couldn't go through the process that's why it's very early on in the training if you can't go through the processes under the water this is just going to get a whole lot harder and it, it, it's building blocks. So that was my one no go. It was those damn procedures of, of escapes and releases. <laughs> and it's only because, and you know, I, I probably did it wrong, but it's because the instructor was complaining. I hurt his arm too much. I, I bent it behind <laughs> his back a little too much. And he says, that's too aggressive for the survivors. And I was oh, like, whatever. That's a, dude. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. But oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, <laughs> you, you do. You do that arm yeah. uh, behind the the sh yeah the, the back. back yeah and I was I was cranking a little too hard on the way up I guess and he said that's a no go and I was because like, I did hurt his shoulder <laughs> and oh, I was like ah, whatever 
<laughs> See, what I would always do when I went through uh, is the first thought in my, my head or the first thing I would do and what I trained myself was just relax. Like the moment, the moment I start, you're going to suck, tuck and duck and kind of, but I would just be like, I'm just going to go all the way to the fucking bottom of the pool and I know they're going to hold on to me. <laughs> and I would basically take my time. And there was one point where they just let go because I was under there for so long. I was like, doo, doo, doo. <laughs> and he just swam up like okay perfect that you passed like well i'll give you the the opposing uh thought of that my uh-huh. airman like uh associate if you will that that survived the mayava the guy that did the jujitsu mm-hmm. uh adopted the jujitsu and and went through the whole airman pro- process with me very hard in in hawaii um what we went through once we got to school, he, he was doing great and he's he was very proficient in the underwater parts of, mm-hmm. of the school, even better than, than myself. Um, and he would do exactly what you just said. He would, I because I got to observe on one of the tests, I was like, we have two pools, two 25 by 25 meters, mm-hmm. but there there's like a, a bridge in between. Um, so it's like two pools that are yep. like, but you can kind of creep underneath. So if you're doing a drill, like an underwater, you can see kind of see what's going, what's on, going on on the other side. And I, I got to see him uh, going through one of his, I think I believe the the combative survivor, the one man, and it was he was in his past. Just to give you a little history of him, he was a a underwater welder. So you know he okay. was like very really proficient underwater. Yeah, <laughs> very comfortable underwater. Uh, older guy though. I think at the like going through the school, I think he was like thirty or something. Okay. And he would do just what like you said. He would go all the way to the bottom of that twelve foot deep pool and mm-hmm. just wait. And I would just watch him like, damn, that's awesome. But <laughs> On the way up, he was passing out. Um, oh, he wouldn't. He yeah, he would go passes. Yeah, and oh, and I guess that. like at that point, yeah, they sent it to medical, which they do when you usually black out in the school. Um, mm-hmm. And and yeah, they he they sent him back, and then it kept happening, and it, it happened three times. So sure enough, he he failed that test, and it was really disheartening because he was so comfortable in the water. Um, that he was just taking that time. And I recall telling him, I think after the second time he failed, I was like, hey, like, dude, I've been through the program with you. I know how good you are underwater. Just don't go underwater that long. Do do the yeah. do the, the release and get back up. And, you know, like you're spending too much time, like regardless of if you're comfortable or not, I guess your heart rate's too elevated for how long you're staying under there. And I don't know, maybe it was just easier for him to do that than the escape and release it. And he did it the third time and unfortunately failed. Um, and then at that point, went through the medical process of getting a heart monitor just to see what was going on. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, through some loophole, wasn't able to get reverted. Uh, the, like the test came back fine for him. Well, but did, did he pass out three times? He passed out three times. I like think. they wouldn't let him go past. Like you can't pass out that many times in school and yeah. continue on. But that's, it was the way he was doing it. Yeah. That's medical yeah, yeah. at that point. Yeah. Especially if, they, if we were to come back with something that can be explained away. I mean, we, we've had. But that's students. the thing. After the heart monitor, I think he was OK. He was like, yeah, by medical, they said there's nothing irregular about the heart and like our assessment of it. But I guess yeah. for some reason, they still didn't let him proceed. That's we, we that's one of those things where it's like, OK, then it becomes a liability because if it's happened before and medical doesn't even know why it's happening if they were to say like okay it was this and it's this issue however he's continued good to training if they were to like pinpoint what it was and say it's probably this um they would probably let him back in training in all honesty Mm -hmm. but the fact that that medical didn't know what it was that makes me feel uncomfortable because i'm like what is the issue we've had people pass out being towed before there was someone who passed out being towed and we're like, okay, you weren't even doing anything and you went limp and passed out. What? Well, what if, if you get towed, like I would get towed, I would hook it up full, full yes. breath of air. Yeah. I'd be holding yeah. my breath the whole time. <laughs> 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 oh man. So, yeah. Here, let me, let me turn on the AC in this room. It's getting hot during the day. Hold on one sec. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to go, I'm going to go pee real quick. Oh yeah. Go ahead. I'm out. You can cut. You don't have to cut this. Just keep it. <laughs> I'll just I'll just keep talking to myself here. All right, I'm back. Quick. How how often would you have candidates passing out? Um, it not too often, honestly. Yeah. Not too often. What I mean, um, you're gonna have it every once in a while, but it's not gonna happen. Like it's not. It doesn't happen every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, would you say it happens more in the beginning or as the 
the challenges increase? I mean, it's different. Um, once you get them, like I would say it's going to happen near the beginning. That's what I would say is near the beginning because they're not comfortable with, with, you know, holding their breath, you know, anything with breath holding is, you know, you know, you always tell the students that too, is if they panic, it's going to raise their heart rate. They're going to burn more oxygen and their CO2 level is going to raise. And that's where you're going to get that tunnel vision and that shallow water blackout. So right. it's about all about staying comfortable. Well, I guess, um, cause one of the things I explained in one of the courses I offer is, yeah, is getting that hypox to that hypoxic state. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and how often they, in the school, I guess the difference between like, you know, the, these elite military schools and say free diving is that, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna be asked to do something that gets your heart rate very high. So like you're every, the, the blood's rushing. Um, and mm -hmm. then you're going to be asked to try to slow that heart rate down as much as possible, but ultimately you know, you'll do as best you can, but then you'll be asked to, to do something underwater. Um, yeah. so I, I don't know what my question was leading in to that, but <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me build on that. Um, yeah. I did in San Diego, I did, uh, the triathlon circuit. Um, yep. as far, like I just, I used to do triathlons a lot. Um, triathlons are challenging depending on whether you're doing Olympic distance, a sprint or whatnot. Um, anyone can really do a sprint. Any people can do a, uh, can do a, a an Olympic distance. It's, you know, if you train for it, you can do it and you can complete it. Um, where I really started seeing what set people apart is doing way longer distance. Like my first, uh, 50 mile race through the, uh, the, basically the mountains, um, it's 50 mile race. It was over, uh, 17,000 feet of elevation change. It was 98 degrees out and it was, and the aid stations were like nine miles apart. And there with that, it's not necessarily, um, how fast it is there is a race so it's how fast you do it but the biggest contributing factor is just people dnfing did not finish a lot of people just don't finish it because if you do not understand what's ahead and you don't pace it out you will you're you're gonna fail if you do, if you mm. can't in a sense and it's that's what it is is i'll call it gaming it but you, you know, okay, I have 50 miles or sometimes, like I said, in training, you don't know what's going to happen next. Sometimes you don't know where you're going to be, you know, I, and in no way do I ever say sandbag it, but a lot of kids sometimes and where it messes them up mentally is they go 110 miles an hour the entire time and it just burns them out. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to have the, we, we want to see, well, you, you'll bump up the heat and I want you to be putting out 90% of the time, but you know, that's just physically not possible. It's just yeah. not, you know, we want to know if you have the ability. It's like the first time I saw someone do an in test. Um, it, they, they sprinted like a quarter mile and then walked because they were <laughs> so gassed. And then they sprinted another quarter mile and they had a mile and a half to do like, dude, throttle it back on that quarter mile and stretch it out for the rest of the way. It's all about throttle control. That's, that's really you just verbalize talking. so clearly what we've tried to explain so many times on this podcast. And, <laughs> and yeah, I love what you said about, you know, kind of sandbagging versus yeah, prep preparing your body for what it's truly capable of. And, and now I recall what I was trying to say earlier is I was going to say like one of the hardest tests I'd say, or just drills right in rescue swimmer school is the sprint downs underwater backs, which is you have to sprint down the length of the 25 meter pool and then immediately dive under and swim mm -hmm. back. Um, and that gets your heart rate up that said, um, I mean, you're not sprinting that. Yeah, you know. that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you, you're not. You're like, not sprinting it. You, and but I'm not, sure they're like, pick it up. Back. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But it's yeah. like they, they are. They are. I mean, if you all out sprint that, it's physically impossible yeah. to make a 25 meter underwater. Like yeah. realistically, yeah. It's well, it's happen. possible, but it's it's it's, it's a very they, they have a, you do it ten times. Yeah. I mean, if you're probably gonna fail out of school if you do that. Yeah. You know, because you're gonna pass out. So you gotta be smart about it. You gotta game the system, like you said. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And like I said, it's not. It's not sandbagging. It's really not. I'm not saying like, you know, cut, cut corners. You're not doing that. You're understanding. And that's really what it comes down to is 
understanding your body, understanding the effort that you put into it, just like me being an instructor, like understanding that spectrum and where to apply it. If you apply it at the wrong place at the wrong time and you dump the bucket, like, and then you have an underwater swim, guess what? <laughs> it's not going to happen, bro. Like mm -hmm. understand where to apply. Like when I did my ultra understanding that I'm not going to be sprinting up fucking hills doing 50 miles. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. You know, that's the other thing I've, I've tried to explain too. And it, for some reason, it doesn't seem to get through the, the candidates heads or 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 my peers going through the the school was you know find out who's best at what figure out where you are in that category and pace yourself off of that person if you're out the gate going faster than the one that you always know ends up first then you're 100 percent doing something wrong there's no oh, there's yeah. nobody that's coming off on the sprint slows down and somehow performs better at the at the end that's not that's not how like anything operates no. um so i would always go like hey all right this guy's the best runner know that you're you always you're probably always gonna come back like third runner so base it off yeah. of maybe that second guy or the you know um, and at the same time you're gonna want to push it a little bit don't be comfortable where you're at so some people will get comfortable where they're at and stay in that place and I'm just saying in life, they'll just stay there forever. Um, one thing that I always did when I did triathlons and what helped me place in a couple uh, triathlons was I, w I knew I was a good swimmer. I knew I'd more than likely be, you know, one of the first ones out of the water. Uh, definitely age group first one out of the water. I knew I was a good runner. I knew the pace I could help hold. I knew I would. I could beat most people in the race. I sucked ass at the bike. So what I would do is I would find my pace. I would see someone who was just a little bit faster than me. And I would try to just fucking stick on their ass end. I mean, obviously you can't draft. So I would try and at least catch that person. And if I didn't, if I never passed them, that's fine. I, you know, I, I knew I pushed it. I knew they were better than me. And I kept up with them. If I passed them, hell yeah, let's go to the next guy. But I knew my weak point and I made sure that each time I improve that a little bit more. Yeah. So not necessarily, again, you need to understand. And that's the, the trickiest part is understanding where you're at and truly understanding where you're at, whether it be physically or mentally, and then finding that person that's just better than you, not incrementally better, but understanding that it's, it's a stair step. Okay. I got to find this next person. That's how you get better. You, you, you surround yourself with people that are just a little bit better than you at all times. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've told the story of in my preparation for rescue swimmer school, I went to what's called like master's programs that are usually often in community pools. They offer those. And a lot of times, yeah, mm -hmm. it starts like 5 a.m. or something, six or 5 a.m. And, and you go I hate and waking up early. Still. I hate it too. And I hate getting in the cold <laughs> so water early. that early. Um, but that's what it was. And, uh, and I had to run there too. So it was like a full, good Ooh. old rescue swimmer like training but the um, great thing nice. about that is you know you have to run home you know after it yeah. like it, it sounds it sounds sucky but you know don't cut the finish line short i always start to interrupt don't cut the finish line short like get that extra little bit in like yeah. you run there and then you get that swim you know you're gonna dump the bucket but you also have to run back but yeah. don't focus on the run back focus on where you're at yeah um and but what so getting to these master's program yeah i was young i was maybe 17 18 at the time and i recall you know the coach going all right you're getting in the slowest lane and i go like you sure because like i looked over there and it was all kind of a little larger uh mostly elderly women like in their 60s <laughs> and 70s and i was like yeah okay. you sure and and he goes like yeah you know just like we'll see and then work, work from there and i was like all right so Sure. He gives us the drill and I, I was, I put myself in front automatically. I was like, oh, come on. Like I got this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got the oh. slowest lane, you know? Uh, yeah. So and like immediately I, you know, I felt the tickle on my toes. Like they were just like, dude, kid, can you move? And I was like, <laughs> Oh, all right. Uh, yeah. I see where I'm at. And then, uh, and that's, that's what I did. I went through the process of working from the back of the 70 year olds, mm -hmm. um, to the front. And then you work your way up the aisles of those different lanes of, you know, by the end I was working with, with folks that are maybe in their thirties their and forties, but really great swimmers, lifelong swimmers with great technique. Um, yeah. but yeah, it was always that, Oh, let me get ahead of this next person that, that I know is a little better than me. And then, and I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm destroying this person now. Like, let's go to the next person and so on and so forth. Um, 
And but, you bring up a very valid point, like humility. That is a yeah. huge thing because a lot of these guys, you know, they come in, they think, oh, I'm, and that was that was a humility. Check. I've had humility checks for sure. Like this is where I thought I was. And then this dude is way better than me and, and shouldn't be. Um, and it, those humility checks is what recenters you. Okay, this is where I'm at. This is where I need to be. This is where I thought I was. You know, checking your ego yeah. is sometimes the hardest thing. What's your biggest pet peeve as an instructor? People thinking they're smarter than the system oh. and having <laughs> no idea what's in store. Um, and you see it all. Uh, we, I see the hate has right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> there's always those, uh, there's always those, those ones you always remember. Uh, like I said, there you, you push past it in a sense, but, um, I always say there's three people within any community and, and I don't know if you guys know this and I, I would always put this out to, um, okay, I'm going to digress, but I think this is really important, especially from where you guys at the, no, the no. rescue swimmer logo, right? Yep. It's in a sense, a, a albatross, right. That, is, that is picking up a, I think, and there's some lore there that says that it's a, a dolphin or a fish or whatnot. But the albatross and the reason why the rescue swimmer community picked the albatross to be their mascot is the scent. It, it dates back to a story of the, what is it? It's, it's the lost mariner. But basically what it was is the ship went out to sea um, and they ended up getting into this horrible storm. Um, it's the rhyme. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. You put it in the comments if you want, yep. but they get lost to see. And then the albatross comes out of the sky and clears. They're, they're basically ready to go under They're The storm's going to encompass them. And then this albatross comes out of the sky and the sky is clear and everything's good. That's where everyone thinks the story stops. Everyone's like, yeah, rescue swimmers, who y'all blah, 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 which is true. Like, hell yeah. What everyone forgets is the rest of the story. A mariner shoots the albatross out of the sky and then the storm comes back and the rest of the crew takes the albatross which is a huge bird ties it around his neck as a punishment and the whole ship goes under and they all die and basically and that's where the the term albatross around the neck comes from is it's it's almost like a curse when you have an albatross around your neck, it's a curse. So I always say within a community, you either build it up or you live off of it. You either shoot the albatross out of the sky and you don't better yourself. You don't better the community. You don't do anything. You just live off of that, that title. Or you are the albatross in the air. You can, you can kill the bird. You can, you know, squeeze the golden goose and, and, and kill it and no, get, get no more golden eggs. Or you can, you can build the reputation. Um, and I kind of forgot the question you're talking about, but as far as, oh, the pet peeve. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, students that come in and you can tell they, 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 they need a humility check. They think they're smarter. Um, you see people that, oh, I'm going to game the system. Um, I will say that they ne your reputation, it's not that instructors go somewhere and they spread bad words about you. That's not the case. Your countenance and your character and everything, if it doesn't change when you leave, people are going to see that. They will see that and they'll notice it. There, there are some students that just sandbagged on runs and they're like, Oh, I'm just trying to help this guy out. You know, they, they would, they would talk like they were the bees knees, like they were awesome. They could do this. And you could tell that they didn't have what, where they were at was actually down here, but the way they talked was up here and they thought they were smarter than the system and some of them did make it through. But when they got to the community, they got freaking blacklisted and they, they, it never went anywhere mm. or they never went anywhere. So as far as, and, and that's the thing too, within the community, within our community, um, my first command, we got rid of 10 swimmers. They made it through training. They made it through everything. They got to the command and uh, they're still training to be had and they couldn't keep the pace. And they just said, you're getting re-rated. You're, you're going to the fleet and you're going to be this. And they were no longer swimmers. They got their wings pulled. Well, one of the things we talked about uh, when we had the Air Force PJ on and 
Okay. Basically, how they restructured their pipeline is mm -hmm. they, I think they've implemented basically personality assessments within their yeah. selection process, right? So, you know, it's it's not all about, hey, all right, we got this guy and he, he meets all the standards. He can do all the push-ups. Um, yeah. It's, it's more about like that guy who, who misses the standard by say two push-ups, but yeah. he's solid everywhere and the team loves him. Are you going to, yeah. are you going to pick him? Are you going to, or sorry, are you going to like blacklist him or, or say he can't make it through and, and join the teams, which he's a great leader. He's a, he's great for the community and, and the team likes to work with him. Or are you going to get the guy that's done, like say the, the all the push-ups requirements and, and aced it, but he's an asshole and nobody wants to work with him. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to be like in the, in the helo with him. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say, is there anything like that right now in Navy Rescue Swimmer School? There's not. I think there should be. Um, I know a lot of the other communities, like I know the SEALs do it. Um, when you're in, when you're in training, uh, you have, it, it's almost, I forget, I don't know what they call it, but it's like a class critique where you basically you're, you are rated through training with your peers. So if everyone like if, and this thing as an instructor, you don't see that inner conflict within it. Um, sometimes, so they get these sheets back and I don't know what they do with them or how that implements in the training personally, but from what I understand and what I hear is like, if, if you're a solid dude, but you're fucking, it, there's a reason why they call Navy's Na the SEAL teams teams. Like you're a team guy, you're a Navy SEAL, you're part of the teams because it's a team concept. If you can't fit it, fit it, fit in with the team, it doesn't matter how much of a Billy badass you are, you're fucking useless. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta be, you have to work with a crew, you work with a team, you work together. Um, and there's going to be conflict and strife, but I think they should implement that. But as far as your, I think it gets broken up two questions is I think they do need to implement that within the pipeline. My personal opinion. Um, the second one would be the standard is the standard and it shouldn't be lowered no matter what you implement as far as if you have that. So if you do have that, that dichotomy of you have someone who is, you know, Billy badass, but an asshole. I don't think he should make it, but if someone who doesn't meet the standard, he doesn't meet the standard. He shouldn't make it. But if someone is, and everyone likes him and he's a solid guy and he's got good work ethic and he ha and he can push himself and he can apply himself, he'll make it. Yeah. He might need remediation, but he'll make it. Mm. If not, something's missing and you shouldn't accept below the standard. Mm. Um, does anything ever break your heart as far as an instructor, as an instructor goes, you know, and, and seeing something hurt occurring with a recruit or a candidate? personal issues when they're dealing with not just what, and that's, it sucks. You can't deal with a lot, but if they're dealing with stuff either at home or, you know, within their marriage or finances or, um, stuff like that, that's hard to see. Cause I mean, you can give them resources, you can give them that, but they still have to deal with that. And that's one more layer that they have to deal with. Mm. That's and yeah. It, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I had the luxury of going in as, as a young, no strings attached individual. Um, but yeah, like having, I guess th there's the asset of having a resource behind you and, and having that like support system, but there's also, yeah, the, the risk of the distraction and, and the other responsibilities that you have to commit to while you go through that school, especially for the, the, the older individuals that go through, you know? Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of it is not, it's usually relationship style stuff. It's yeah. not necessarily cause I we, we would say like you, you could get paid on freaking you know, the first blow all your money. And, and when you're in training, you got the chow hall and you have a place to stay as long as you can make it back, you're good. And you're not going into debt. Like, and a lot of people like, yeah, they'll, they, they won't get themselves in too much water, hot water financially. Yeah, it will happen. But a lot of it is uh relationship, personal deaths, um, stuff like that. That's always hard to see. Cause you, mm. I mean, what can, you can't really do a lot. Yeah. It sucks. People make poor decisions or bad decisions that you can't control. And I mean, it is what it is. What kind of advice can you give to everyone listening in that's that's going down that trying to become a rescue swimmer route? You know, what what should they prepare for and uh, what should they want out, like not out of it per se, but what, you know, 
What do you think is a good why as far as becoming a Navy swimmer? The biggest thing I see is people want to come in and they, uh, they want to, it's very, and it's hard. It, everyone's going to deal with it at some point. Um, the why they want to come in is they want the notoriety. They want the notoriety of, I want to be known for, and you see it in every community. I want to, you know, deploy here and people know that I'm a badass, like, or I, I want to, you know, save so many lives. I want to be a, you know, senior chief Randall, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not about you. It's never about you. It's, it's, it's a hundred percent, not about you. Yes you are important and there's that balance of like you have to take care of yourself um but what i would say is get your life in order first and what i mean by that is anything you have um family wise uh financially wise like make sure you have a solid foundation you're humble humility is a huge one and you're you're hungry to learn and take and take every opportunity you have to learn something new. I, I have a, even after the fact that I think that's one, one reason. And, and this is me speaking about myself, uh, not in a cocky way, but in, in a, in a way that I hope everyone does, but learn something new every day, even after training, before training, like always try to better yourself and find your weak spots and understand them. My weak spot before I came in was running. I was a good swimmer. I failed my first in test run. I was not in the best shape. Uh, running is now my strong suit. Hmm. I made, I made my weak spot, my strong suit because I focused on it so much that I was able to, you know, my fastest run time I ever did, I think was like 755 mile and a half. So I ended up low. It, it, it took a lot of time. I'm, I'm nowhere near that now. No way. Um, yeah. Get a good foundation, find your weak spots, improve on them and, and, and get, get your life in order. That's what I would say. We, we didn't even talk about, um, like, why do you think people choose Navy rescue swimmer versus coast guard? Um, I, I, I think it's a lot of, uh, br branding, advertisement and i honestly think if people were to understand the differences between let's say uh pj's coast guard and navy rescue swimmers um, a lot of them would probably go like actually understand a day in the life and i'll wholeheartedly say it um there are people that would probably go either coast guard or they would go uh, Air Force PJs because it's more specialized, more focused, and they they want to do that. Now there are people that want to join the Navy to see the world. That's definitely, and you're always staying on a coast, so you're you're always going to be someplace cool. Whether that be I was in San Diego for ten years, or you're going to go to you know Virginia, or you're going to go to Japan. Um, there's plenty of opportunities, but I think the biggest thing is. And I know they're trying to fix it. I that's why I created the channel. Is there's a lot of misconceptions about Navy rescue swimmers, and a lot of people don't know where where the focus is and what to do. Like what what's a day in in a Navy rescue swimmer's life? It's it's a complicated question. Um, but I would say you get a little bit of everything, and because you're everywhere, like your exposure to stuff is, you have you can go to rescue swimmer school. I'm getting off topic. Sorry. Um, but I think you're on a roll. Yeah. <laughs> I, I go on tangents if you can't tell. Maybe, maybe it's the instructor in me, you know, just going off and, and saying for, and people just have to listen. Um, I would say the big difference. And I, the one thing I would say would be different is if you want just to do aviation, you know, having friends within your guys community and stuff like that, if you want to do be an aviation swimmer and that's your goal, go coast guard. If you want to do, if you want to do uh, combat search and rescue, and basically, you know, get jump called stuff like that, I would go Air Force PJ. If you want to have a little bit of everything, in a sense, and not necessarily you're not the subject matter expert in all of those, um, but understand that 
there's gives and takes with everything. I think people choose the Navy because of the quality of life. And <laughs> you hear that? What are you yeah. doing? Um, quality of life is usually a little higher. Upper mobility is a little bit higher. And you get to see more places. I had a buddy that stayed in, was in Bahrain. You can go to Rota, Rota Spain, Naples, Italy. Like you can go all over the place. And, but the, hard thing that I will say that I think people don't communicate well is on the outside, the transfer into a civilian job, there's, there's not a huge changeover within the aviation. It's hard to get those. Um, I don't know about you, but I only know about one or two people that got out as an aviation swimmer and went straight into, uh, he went to Bristol basically as a, uh, a rescue swimmer. Mm, so, yeah, there's not many jobs that really translate at all. Yeah. I suppose for us, you could be an EMT. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, but that's that's crappy thing is we don't even have that. You can yeah. you can request it and it's an option, but yeah, you but that's not even you're not even working your way up there. You're actually going to be paid less, you know. So it's not yeah. like necessarily what, something you want to do. Yeah, yeah. probably so, working more. Yeah. and with working more, yeah. paid less. Yeah, it's almost minimum wage. It's crazy the amount of responsibility AMT has for what oh, they yeah. get paid. It's it's absurd. Oh yeah, um, yeah. What were we talking about but, before? I had questions lined up here. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you asked about why people choose the Navy over any other, and on in all honesty, I like I said, I think the Navy does a bad job at appealing towards the people that do want to be Navy Air candidates, is what they call it. I don't think they tell them because a lot of got a lot of the guys that we would get um, at the command, they thought they were going to be rescue swimmers, and that was the only thing they were going to do. And just like you, like, what do you mean I got to sew shit, like? That yeah. isn't communicated that well to them. So they kind of get disgruntled about it. Yeah. And a lot of people that I talk to um, just to the Instagram page and stuff, they always come to me and they'll say like, they're trying to decide between Coast Guard and Navy. And to me, it's not like something, it's not a decision. You know, you should know which one because it's a totally different job. Like it you is. have some shared responsibilities, but it's not the same job at all. Oh yeah. So it's kind of a, yeah, I don't know. There's it's different a big and it's where you want to go. Yeah. Like, for example, uh, Whidbey is our big uh, station SAR asset, Whidbey Island. There's a ton of rescues out there, and it's hard to get people up there sometimes. They don't want to go. Yeah, what do you guys have to do when you're, sta- when you're stationed on a boat? So, depends on where you're at. Um, one thing I love doing, I did a vert rip cruise where it's just, you go out, you, you're still uh, on an alert status sometimes, um, but the big thing is you're resupplying the fleet. So, you're basically slinging up loads underneath the aircraft and taking them from place to place doing pmc transfers um packs mail cargo so transferring packs you know mail and and cargo like ammo offloads taking all the ammo off of one ship and putting on another and it's super high pace and it's super fun in the best way like a lot of people look at you like why the hell would i ever want to do that i loved it you're in the delta pattern waiting for someone to eject worst case scenario. So we call it burn holes in the sky. Um, if you're on a vert rip cruise, you're, it, it, it's basically the pilot is think of, think of the pilot as he's playing the crane game and he's blindfolded and you're telling him where to put it. Nice. So <laughs> it's, it's fun. And what's this anti-submarine mission? Like, what do you guys do with that? So I don't deal with that. That's Romeo's. So the moment you make it through rescue summer school, you get split up into two different pipelines. Um, I believe it's still that same way. I, I can't speak to that uh, personally, but when, you know, it, it, you either go Romeo or you go Sierra. Sierras are uh, basically Miss Potato Heads where you can put guns on them. You can put, you can do vert reps, stuff like that. Uh, Romeos can do the same, but they're more of a, uh, surveillance platform they still have the same things we have but the big thing that they do that we do not do is sub hunting so uh, we learn very basic underwater acoustics in our schooling they learn in depth underwater acoustics and sub hunting stuff so um, as far as that too i don't know if you guys hold um you have to have a secret clearance and at some places you right. have a, a, a ts clearance does that mission apply to uh, like stateside drug inter- interdiction stuff or no uh so we do so, so romeos can do it but mainly because we haven't they have so much avionics in the back of romeo helicopters um not too often they'll normally if if i were for example uh 
a team, I would want an open cockpit, which is a Sierra. You have two doors, like a minivan. Um, so you have both sides that can open. Uh, that I that would be maritime interdiction operation. The gotcha. squadron I was at before uh, helped with the whole Maersk, Alabama stuff of uh, Captain Phillips. So they they had okay. basic. So it just depends on the platform and what you're available for. Gotcha. Romeos are heavier, Sierras, and have more uh, sub honey acoustics kind of stuff. Sierras are more open. We give each other crap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and do you get a choice? I guess you get a choice when you're coming out of the pipeline or like when you graduate from summer school, do you get a choice whether you go Sierra or Romeo? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how they do it anymore. Maybe. Uh, I think you might have a choice based on seniority. Seniority, Maybe not. Uh, there's no real standard operating procedure on that. If they, cool. And it depends on billets. My entire class got Sierra. If I would, if I would go through and they had a Romeo platform, I'd be, I'd be doing sub hunting stuff. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah. And how do you guys, uh, you know, distribute the graduates of the rescue swimmer school? Do you do it strictly on seniority or on how well they performed in the school? So, um, I can just tell you about my experience. Uh, they, so when I went through school, they, you had air crew school. So the Higgs out pipeline lays out, you got air crew school, which is making sure you're physically, physiologically adapt. You can, you can basically do the helo dunker. You're not going to pass out while flying. You don't get motion sickness, stuff like that. Then you go to rescue swimmer school, aviation rescue swimmer school, aviation rescue swimmer school is where most of the attrition happens. Then you go to air AWA school. And that's where the split happens from Romeo or Sierra. Um, from there, what, they used to do was if you, um, depending on your scores and whatnot, you could choose based upon your placement. And if all this, if let's say there was four Sierra seats and there was six Romeo seats and there are four guys ahead of you and they all chose Sierra, well then guess you're going Romeo. Everyone after that's going Romeo. Or let's say they, the, there was four Romeo seats and there was six Sierras and you wanted to go, uh, Romeo and four people ahead of you chose Romeo, well, you're going Sierra because that's all that's left. Um, I don't know if they still do it that way, uh, but then once you go through your A school, you go to the RAG where you learn about the aircraft, learn how to fly, learn about the different stuff as far as more of the flight technician that you talked about. That's where you do A school. Um, at the same time, they're teaching pilots how to fly. So they're teaching you how to water ski while they're teaching someone how to drive the boat. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> what's personally how about yourself what's your favorite thing that you possibly can do on the job on the job hmm. i mean i really i mean everyone likes likes to get called on a sar uh i mean you know or a case is what you guys call it everyone likes that call um that will stay it, it's challenging the time i like there's a, there's a breed within the community because we do everything. Everyone knows that if you want something done or you want something fixed, you come to a crewman, you come to one of us, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Uh, I like problem solving. I like getting challenging situations and using resources um, to fix the solution, depending on what it is. Where I'm at now, I like teaching. I truly enjoy teaching. Um, I'm not doing that as much anymore. So now it's more uh, supervisor leadership. I like leading sailors and seeing their growth and seeing where they're at and where they where they could become. But at, when I was junior, I would say um, definitely get definitely you know getting called on you guys a couple of cases. You know, doing the the humanitarian disaster relief in Japan. You know, that'll stick with me forever. You know, um, yeah. Hmm. That's great. Uh, what are you up to now? Uh, right now, I am. Uh, you're talking right now, right now, or no, not right now, right now. <laughs> but like, what's what's, uh, what's in the near future? You know, or what, what are uh, your current ambitions? So I would say, I mean, you got you guys are going to be the first one. I didn't put this out on my channel. I was planning on, but um, I'm submitting an officer package and and trying trying to uh, move on into bigger and better things. So. Um, I won't say what community I'm submitting to, uh, but I am submitting after a while, it takes a toll on the body. 
Um, I will say that if you, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I will say if you can, um, if you can stay in, take care of your body, but after a while, it just take it takes its toll. So I'm looking soon to transfer to a, a different position, a different job and, and get a commission and, and do something different. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Hey, I love your, your YouTube videos. Why don't you tell folks where, where they can find you? Um, cause I certainly learned a lot just watching all the informative material <laughs> you put out there. Yeah. Uh, so you can find me on YouTube. Uh, if you just search Jeffrey Jorgensen, it'll pop up. It's the first result. Uh, I don't have, I always forget my freaking channel name. Isn't it Jeff Jorgens? Yeah, Jeff but Jorgens. it'll be, I'm sure you'll put it in, in, in the link, but yeah, well, uh, I, I do everything from, I, I like tech stuff. I like, uh, learn, you know, bettering myself in any way. So I, 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 I play video games. I'll, I'll wholeheartedly admit that I am a world of Warcraft nerd, which is surprising <laughs> to some, um, but uh, I go over a lot of more. I'll probably split the channel here soon into <laughs> gaming and then have a more fitness related channel. So oh, cool. uh, talk about the athletic stuff. nerd. So if you guys have questions, hit me up. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Uh, yeah. And I just saw uh, it on YouTube. It's Jeff Jorgensen. So, but we'll put yep. the link uh, at the bottom of, if you're listening on Spotify, check it out there. If you're listening on Apple podcasts, it doesn't work for some reason. Unbelievable. So check it out on Spotify. It, yeah. 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 Spotify yeah. link. Yeah. Are you having a problem with Spotify? Cause I used to do a podcast and it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. We're, to get no, we, we have it um, on Spotify easily because we use what we use as far as launching our podcast is uh, anchor and anchors basically okay by spotify so so it's real easy okay. on spotify but it's a real pain in the butt on anything else um yeah okay. i have my own podcast well it it streams to everything but apple's just kind of an issue with hyperlinks and stuff yeah so yeah but yeah, yeah. apple has its own <laughs> it's thing, apple so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i run like another podcast the world entertainment podcast and that's like a whole issue in itself because you can't even look that up you have to look up the episode titles right now so it's all the, the nitpicky stuff whatever right? yeah whatever. inside baseball yeah <laughs> yep um but yeah, all right. Um, Jeff Jorgensen, thanks so much for, for coming on the rest yeah, of the mindset. Thanks for yeah, on, thanks guys. a lot. So that was Jeff Jorgensen. Great episode. That's probably going to be our biggest episode, I would say, because there's a lot of people who like to hear the difference between Navy and Coast Guard, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, there we go. so yeah. A very, a, very uh, educated man. Thanks for coming on. Very educated. I also like how he got a psychology degree just to help his students out. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about the programs that we have going on at RSM. So if you missed the Black Friday sale last week, I mean, you're you're a donkey. Like you should have bought, should have bought a program because it was way cheaper. But if you <laughs> kind of realize that you missed out and you want to get a program, they're still for sale. They're just going to be 40% more expensive than they were. So still not a bad price the programs are legit <laughs> yeah no one's complaining about uh what they get for what they paid so we still have the mile yeah. and a half here's a real here's a real quick thing yeah. we have a 100 percent refund basically policy so if you take the program and you actually don't like it just tell us and we'll just give you your money back you can keep the program we don't even care yeah and we haven't really had anybody take us up on that yet so yeah that just kind of speaks to that great um but yeah mile and a half uh if you're training for that or you know you just are running you want to run that specific distance and, and train um check that out the hold your breath like a helicopter rescue swimmer program thorough course on how to hold your breath and underwater evolutions if you're a free diver it's a great course if you want to be around and you know somebody's drowning out there maybe you can help out dive under and and uh give give some assistance we also have the win, win the day program win the day win the day program uh and that's just general training. So if you want to train like a helicopter rescue swimmer and get fit, get jacked, get after it, get lit out in the pool and on the... That one has a lot of questions sometimes. So yeah. people ask, like, we'll get DMs that say, what's a good program if I'm training for, you know, pararescue, marine recon, or rescue swimmer school? This is the program for that. It's not necessarily like the drills that you see in that program aren't tailored to a specific school. They're just based around increasing your fitness aerobic endurance and aerobic endurance and your water confidence so it has kind of everything you need and then from that point on you can specialize once you get that baseline fitness you can specialize you know go take a program designed specifically to to like hold up logs like you do in freaking seal and buds or in summer school you do a lot of brick treading so that would be a different program but this one is just getting that baseline fitness up to the point you can actually do those drills great 
And uh, yeah, check out our upcoming program, the log lifts for Navy SEAL school. <laughs> Straight log up, lifts. go in the woods, cut down a tree, cut it about 10 feet long, get a couple buddies and lift it over your head about 100 that's times. A, that's all Buds is, right? It's just that? It's yeah. log lifts. <laughs> right we need a navy seal on here to yeah to we need, tell to, us we need to get a seal yep. yeah <laughs> uh great uh yeah leave a rating review on the rescue storm mindset podcast on apple Podcasts, and that helps us out helps it expand helps it grow helps the community grow if you want to join the community where do they go cody they're gonna to go to the rsm training circle on our facebook page you have to ask to join i'll approve you or vince will approve you if you're, cool. you're in the group if you're cool, you got to have a cool profile picture. Yep. Just kidding. As long as you look seem like you're a legit profile, yep. you'll get approved. You can join the community and ask questions, get and read all the freaking freaking hundreds of posts that have already been posted there. And get all your questions answered. And like we mentioned in the upcoming week, we have a workshop slash private masterclass uh, that will be a PowerPoint run by Cody and I. We're still uh, we're probably going to do it on underwater techniques and. There's going to be a limited capacity as well. That's right. Just because it's based on the platform. So yeah. we're not really sure of that size yet, but there will be a limited number of seats, just yep. so you know. So you might want to hop on that so quick when the link comes out. Yeah, it'll be a detailed class. And uh, and then, yeah, you can ask as many questions as you want. At the end, we'll, we'll have a lot of time for that. So join us on there. And lastly, my podcast, the very entertaining, very wild, very raunchy at times, very just gritty. Just the outdoorsy. Gritty. It's an outdoorsy podcast. Yeah, outdoor podcast. Yeah. Uh, the Wildertainment podcast on all podcast apps, except the Apple podcast. It's on there, but you have to look up something like Sleeping with a Bear or uh, the, our, one of our, our bestsellers so far, the Mountain Crash. So you have to look up Helicopter Crash in Mountains. So look that up on Apple Podcasts and you'll you'll get that great episode. You can follow that. Leave a rating review. That helps me out. So this is a, a new one. Right on. Help it. Help Vince out. Yep. Get his podcast blown up. Will so. Dertame the podcast. Um, that's it. All right, people. COVID is going to end any second. Now. Vaccine. Any second. Any second. All right. Yep. Talk soon. Peace.